this is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to this clean cut episode of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. My name is Bryce Blankenagle. Today is May 5th, 2016, and thank you for joining me. Today's episode is very special in that we're taking on one big topic in Mormon history with a clean-cut approach. Today, we'll be talking about race and the priesthood. It's well known among most Mormon circles that any African-American member of the church couldn't have the priesthood until 1978, and it's thought by most that this was a tenet of Mormonism from its inception. Fortunately, for us at least, there's much more nuance to the subject that deserves a much deeper dive to really understand, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Let's start off with discussing where this religious tenant came from, and why it's important that blacks couldn't have the priesthood since the early days of the church. Now, let me just say right at the onset, I apologize in advance if the term black or black people is offensive in any way because I'm not using it that way and I don't mean it to be. I'll merely be using it for the ease of conversation. Also, another important thing to understand is the type of people we'll be talking about today. The people in Mormon history that are responsible for blacks not getting the priesthood were quite racist, and those racist beliefs shine through in sometimes uncouth or abrasive ways, but I refuse to censor anything these men have said, because we need to hear the terminology they used and understand the historical context that made those terms okay. Most of the quotes we read today have offensive language or slurs towards African Americans, but that was just typical conversation for most of those people. So this is your official trigger warning. This episode is clean cut, so there won't be any vitriolic or offensive language from me personally, as is the nature of any clean cut episodes of the show. However, there will be some racist language used in quotes given by men that are long dead. If you're sensitive to those words, then this episode probably isn't for you. All right, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started here. It's important to understand the origination of racism in the Mormon church and the scriptural justifications that were used to keep black people subservient or, you know, some kind of lower class in the church. It's understood that righteousness and skin color are directly related in the Book of Mormon, and this is the idea that serves as the seed for our studies today. So this is taken from the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon, starting with 2 Nephi in today's chapter 30, verses 5 through 6. Quote, and the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be declared among them, wherefore they shall be restored unto the knowledge of their fathers, and also to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which was had among their fathers. And then shall they rejoice, for they shall know that it is a blessing unto them from the hand of God, and their scales of darkness shall begin to fall from their eyes, and many generations shall not pass away among them, save they shall be a white and a delightsome people. And it shall come to pass that the Jews which are scattered also shall begin to believe in Christ, and they shall begin to gather in upon the face of the land, and as many as shall believe in Christ shall also become a delightsome people. End quote. All right, that is the basis for the Mormon belief that righteousness and skin color go hand in hand. While we understand this to be quite ridiculous nowadays, it was a sincerely held religious belief in the time of the Book of Mormon. This is from the same book, 2 Nephi, in today's chapter 5, verse 21. Quote, 
And he caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing, because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, and they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white, and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they may not be enticing unto my people, the Lord did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. End quote. All right. This is pretty solid evidence provided in the Book of Mormon, the central point of uh, Mormon canon, that skin color is associated with righteousness and standing in the Lord's eyes. This passage explicitly says that anybody with black skin is not righteous and therefore deserving of a skin of blackness becoming like unto a flint so that they might not be enticing unto my people. This implies that anybody with black skin should be unattractive <laughs> to any righteous person with white skin, so their seed doesn't intermingle or whatever that is. We're just getting started, so if any of this racism turned your stomach so far, you're in for quite a ride today. The implication of being cursed with a dark skin for being sinful should go the other way. I mean, just logically speaking, right? So, you know, if a black person becomes righteous, their skin should turn white. And likewise, if a white person becomes sinful, their skin should turn black, right? Well, with our current understanding of modern genetics and melanin, we know this to be absolutely absurd. But this is one central belief in the Book of Mormon. Here's another excerpt from it. This is Third Nephi in today's chapter 2, verse 15. Quote, and their curse was taken from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites, end quote. Now, these are all passages out of the Book of Mormon, which claims to be the most correct book on earth, revealed to Joseph Smith by the Lord God. The thing is, this book is central to Mormonism, and this is one of the core teachings of it. Not only that, but we can see how this teaching pervaded the early church. In the next quote we'll read, it it's in relation to an early missionary trip to proselyte to the Lamanites in Missouri. This was recounted by William Wines Phelps to Brigham Young, and he was quoting Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the church. The context of the quote is something necessary to understand before reading the quote. Joseph Smith had told this missionary force to go to the land on the borders with the Lamanites, which meant Missouri at the time, and preach to them for the purpose of converting the Lamanites to Mormonism, the Lamanites, of course, being the Native Americans. This was done in late 1830 and eventually elicited a trip to Missouri by Joseph himself the next year, during which he revealed the location of Zion to be Independence, Missouri. This is the quote from Joseph Smith, recounted by his good friend and fellow brother in the church, William Wines Phelps. It's a revelation where Joseph is speaking as the mouthpiece of God. Quote, it is my will that in time ye should take unto you wives of the Lamanites and Nephites, that their posterity may become white, delightsome, and just. End quote. This revelation is a double whammy, because it was commanding elder missionaries that were already married to marry Native American women so that their children could become white and delightsome. I mean, it's polygamy and racism all wrapped into one revelation. I mean, it's a twofer offensive from God, given through the mouth of his one true prophet, Joseph Smith. Now, what fascinates me so much is the fact that this belief never went away, but rather was built upon by generations of LDS church leaders. Even Joseph himself built on these teachings, which resulted in passages in the Pearl of Great Price, which were seemingly even more racist. For anybody that's unaware, the Book of Mormon was the first book canonized into Mormon Holy Scripture. The second book was the Book of Commandments, which later became the Doctrine and Covenants. And the third book is the Pearl of Great Price, which was compiled about seven years after Joseph Smith's death, but it was taken from various sources of Joseph's work and revelations. This is from the Book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price, the third Book of Mormon canon. Moses chapter 7, verse 8, quote, there was a blackness came upon all the children of Canaan that they were despised among all people, end quote. And it goes on further into that chapter, verse 22, quote, and they were a mixture of all the seed of Adam, save it was the seed of Cain, for the seed of Cain were black and had not place among them, end quote. All right, these are solid passages that describe the seed of Cain being cursed with black skin. 
so they would be despised among all people. But the Pearl of Great Price digs in even deeper when we get into the Book of Abraham, which was supposedly translated from Egyptian funerary texts that the church purchased in the mid-1830s. This is from the Book of Abraham, chapter 1, verse 25 through 27, quote, now the first government of Egypt was established by Pharaoh, the eldest son of Egyptus, the daughter of Ham. Noah, his father, who blessed him with the blessings of the earth, but cursed him as pertaining to the priesthood. Now Pharaoh, being of the lineage by which he could not have the right of priesthood, end quote. And that is where we get the scriptural foundation for anybody being of the seed of Cain not being allowed to have the priesthood. That is the primary scripture the priesthood ban stems from. But when a person says that blacks couldn't have the priesthood, the implications were much deeper than just not being able to pass a sacrament of church or, you know, lay their hands upon people to give them a priesthood blessing. Not being allowed the priesthood was just the bottleneck point that was used to relegate black people to being a second class members of the church. The basic restriction was that they couldn't have the priesthood, which was the crux of their limitation to salvation. Now, when I say salvation, I mean the ability to ascend to the celestial kingdom to live with God after death, right? Now, when a faithful priesthood-holding man dies in the church, he performs the various signs and tokens to enter the celestial kingdom, where he can call his various wives through the veil to live with him in the celestial kingdom on his own planet. But the man is only able to do so if he's a faithful member of the church and holds all the necessary keys of the priesthood. To reiterate, only men with the priesthood and their wives are allowed into the highest level of heaven in the Mormon church. So not allowing blacks to have the priesthood was the checkpoint that they couldn't pass, forcing them to spend all eternity in lesser kingdoms of heaven. Now, the argument can be made that once they die and ascend as a righteous person, their skin will change from black, like, <laughs> like a flint, to white and delightsome. Of course, those are scriptural tenets allowing them to attain the priesthood, but this requires a fair amount of posthumous temple work to be done to give them the priesthood, and thus their righteous works on earth are somehow less valuable than their white and delightsome counterparts' works. Not to mention that there's no way of testing such a claim that posthumous exaltation could even work, but that's beside the point, right? The most fascinating thing about this priesthood ban being part of Mormon canon is the fact that it was never enforced until Brigham Young became president of the church in 1844. Now, remarkably, Joseph Smith didn't seem to mind black people all that much having the priesthood you know, during his lifetime, which is something we'll discuss momentarily. But before that, we need to talk about the inherent racism of Joseph Smith's time, because... I, I just don't think there's any way of understanding this topic without understanding what frontier life was like in the American 1830s. It's well known that slavery has been a contentious point in American history since it was used to create and sustain the agriculture-based economy of the South. Owning other people as property was a disagreement at the heart of a lot of Mormon persecution in its early days, especially in Missouri. The vast majority of Mormons in the early days of the church were from northern non-slave states like, you know, New York, Pennsylvania, Vermont, etc. So most early Mormons were either opposed to slavery or, you know, just didn't really fall strongly on one side or the other regarding slavery. This became an issue when the Mormons started flocking to Missouri, which was the northernmost slave state in the Union. Not to mention the Center for Mormon Rapture, being Independence, Missouri. The majority of Missouri citizens wanted to own slaves or did own them while hundreds of Mormons were moving into Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. Now, a small number of Mormons moving in was nothing more than a nuisance to the Missourians, but it started becoming a problem when there were enough Mormons moving in to actually sway voting and change public policy. This became an existential threat to the Missourian farming communities that relied on slave labor for their economy to continue the way it was. If there were enough Mormons to make up a majority and vote the right of owning slaves out of law, the entire economy of Missouri could realistically collapse, which caused a lot of hatred and anger against the Mormons, and that's where a lot of their persecution came from. This hatred 
was manifest in a couple of small scuttles, resulting in the loss of life of both Missourians and Mormons alike, which further fueled the Mormon persecution complex. Add in the fact that Mormons were proselyting to slaves, encouraging them to come to church or teaching them how to read the Book of Mormon, and the Mormons really became a thorn in the paw of the Missourians that wanted to keep their slaves ignorant and subservient to their own will. Joseph was no different than the majority of anti-slavery believing Mormons, making him somewhat progressive in his ideas about black people being equals. That's a sentiment that can't be lost in our discussion today. Joseph was relatively progressive and tolerant for his time, much, much more so than Brigham Young, which we'll get to soon. So back to something I mentioned earlier, the priesthood ban didn't come into place until Brigham Young took over as president and prophet of the LDS church. Given the nature of the Book of Mormon, Joseph was much more inclusive than many of his followers. Now, what I mean by that was Joseph was trying to include Native Americans and African Americans into his church and not exclude them like Brigham Young did. Joseph even ordained a black man with the priesthood and called him to be an elder of the church and a general authority as a member of the Quorum of the Seventy. This man was named Elijah Abel. And he had an amazingly unique past in the church, as did his children. Elijah Abel joined the church in 1832 and was ordained as an elder, probably by Joseph Smith. Um, Some people say that it might have been Zebedee Coltrane, but we're not really sure. And that happened on March 3rd, 1836. And after that, he was ordained into the third quorum of the 70s in 1839. He was born in 1808, a slave in Maryland, but escaped to Canada on the Underground Railroad, presumably in the late 1820s. Now, once he was a member of the Quorum of the Seventies, Joseph actually called him to be a mortician in Nauvoo in 1839 or maybe 1840. So Elijah Abel here, this, this early church member that was a black man, was actually seen as an equal member of the church and a priesthood holder until his death in Utah in 1884. He was even a general authority, being a member of the Quorum of the Seventy. Now, what's even more remarkable is the legacy that he left behind. Elijah's son Enoch and his grandson Elijah were all members of the Utah LDS Church under Brigham Young and were all worthy priesthood holders holding leadership roles in the church during the time that black people supposedly couldn't have the priesthood. But what we do need to point out is the fact that Elijah and his family were the exception to the rule, though. And they probably just only got a pass because they were very light-skinned black people and they were good friends with Joseph Smith. Some people weren't even aware that Elijah was black until somebody else told them that he was. I mean, that's how they were the exception that proved the rule, right? There were very few other black people in the early church that were given the priesthood and thus allowed it to enter the temple and given access to the celestial kingdom. Now, given Elijah's history with Joseph Smith, he was a friend, and I believe that allowed him to be seen as more equal than any other black person that joined the church after him. Unfortunately, there are many, many, many more unpleasant examples once Brigham Young took over that seem to embody the less than subtle racism that pervades the history of the LDS church. Once Brigham took over as president, he made this proclamation around 1853, quote, Any man having one drop of the seed of Cain in him cannot hold the priesthood, and if no other prophet ever spake it before, I will say it now in the name of Jesus Christ. I know it is true and others know it. And from this point on, any black person trying to get into the celestial kingdom was completely stonewalled, with the exception of Elijah Abel's son and grandson, Enoch and Elijah. And, you know, just one or two others. But for some reason, it's really hard to find information on them. Now, this became a real problem when we look at somebody like Jane Elizabeth Manning. Jane Manning was a shining example of what a faithful and exemplary member of the church should be. She was born a free black woman and converted to Mormonism in the early 1840s at the age of 14. She made the 800-mile walk with some of her family to live in Nauvoo. The story is recounted that she walked until her shoes fell off and then still continued walking bare feet through snow and over frozen bodies of water. 
When Jane Manning arrived in Nauvoo, she was offered a room in the Nauvoo mansion by Emma, who took her in and taught her homemaking. During Jane's time in the Nauvoo mansion, she and Emma became very close, and Jane even later recalled that Emma offered to adopt her while Jane lived in the mansion. Um, at the time, of course, Jane turned down the offer. But Jane married another black Mormon that was living in Nauvoo at the time, and eventually made the pilgrimage to Utah after Joseph's death. And unfortunately, there she outlived her husband. And this is where we really begin to see the real-world impact of the ban on blacks having access to full salvation. Jane was a very faithful and good member of the church throughout all her days. She even donated a substantial amount of her own personal funds for the construction of the Salt Lake City Temple. I mean, she was no Jack Mormon, or, well, you know, in this case, like a Jane Mormon, but Jane's marriage to a black man made it so she was unable to get into the celestial kingdom, of course, because he couldn't receive the priesthood and go through the temple to receive his endowments to enter the celestial kingdom in order to call her through the veil. Since Emma had asked if Jane wanted to be adopted before Jane went to Utah, Jane asked then-president of the church, Wilford Woodruff, if she could be sealed to the Smiths in order to enter the Celestial Kingdom. Woodruff agreed, but with a caveat or two, and that's where we have a problem. Due to Jane's cursed black skin, she couldn't enter the temple to have a sealing ordinance performed. Remember, this is a temple that she had donated some of her own money in order to help fund the building costs. But the problem is the ordinance was done by proxy. Joseph F. Smith, a nephew of Joseph Smith, stood in for Joseph, and a woman named Bathsheba Smith stood in for Jane, and the sealing ordinance was done. Now, normally, when ordinances are done by proxy, it's because the person they're performing the ordinance for is dead. Thus, baptisms for the dead. That's an ordinance performed for the dead by proxy. But Jane Manning was still alive when this happened. She was just required to sit outside of the temple while a white woman stood in for her during the sealing process. Just because Jane was black. What kind of message did that send to her? She was considered the equivalent of dead spiritually because she carried the curse of Cain. Now, the biggest smack in the face was hidden in the details of the ordinance, though. Not only was she unable to be sealed to her own husband to get in the celestial kingdom, not only was she not able to attend the ordinance as herself on behalf of herself, even though she had contributed to the construction of the temple, but when she was sealed to Joseph and Emma, she wasn't sealed as a spiritual daughter or sister like all the other spiritual adoptions were, but rather their servant. Jane Manning was sealed for time and all eternity to Joseph and Emma as their eternal slave, just because she had black skin. When she understood the implications and details of her sealing ceremony that she wasn't able to attend, she was understandably frustrated and appealed to the presidency to seal her as an equal to Joseph and Emma, but she was denied and died in 1908 without gaining full access to the celestial glory that should have awaited her upon death. Now, this is a very real example of the harsh implications of racism in the early church. Unfortunately, it wasn't an issue relegated to just the early church, though. Rather, it was a core tenant of their belief structure until 1978, more than 120 years after Brigham officially instated the priesthood ban on black people. These problems that Jane Manning dealt with have been represented throughout Mormon history for over a century, and Jane is by far not a singular occurrence. The priesthood ban affected countless families, marked with the curse of Cain for what seems like incomprehensible reasons, but that's what we're going to try and get to the bottom of today. Now, what was the logical justification for keeping anybody marked with the curse of Cain as a second-class member? Now, we understand the scriptural basis for it, both from the Book of Mormon as well as many passages from the Pearl of Great Price, but as with any controversial Mormon doctrine, there will always be apologetic answers for why black people couldn't have the priesthood. 
This is a quote from Orson Hyde, taken from the meeting minutes when he made a speech to the high priest quorum in Nauvoo in April of 1845. Now, while Orson Hyde was never a prophet or a president of the church, he served as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles under Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, and was a very faithful man in the church for his entire life, taking many wives and holding many leadership callings in the organization of the church. And this is the quote that he said, quote, These spirits were not considered bad enough to be cast down to hell, he's talking about black people, of course, and never have bodies, Neither were they considered worthy of an honorable body on this earth, honorable meaning white. Now it would seem cruel to force pure celestial spirits into the world through the lineage of Canaan that had been cursed. This would be ill appropriate, putting the precious and vile together. But those spirits in heaven that rather lent an influence to the devil thinking he had a little the best right to govern, but did not take a very active part, anyway were required to come into the world and take bodies in the accursed lineage of Canaan, and hence the Negro or African race. End quote. So basically what Orson Hyde was saying is black people sinned in the pre-mortal existence, and they didn't sin enough to go with Satan to uh, you know, be part of the third of the host of heaven that abandoned with Satan and went to hell, uh, but they were not good enough to actually receive white bodies. So instead, they came to earth in black bodies, and that's where he says, hence the Negro or African race. The next quote is from Joseph Fielding Smith, who was the great nephew of the revered Joseph Smith, and he was speaking in the capacity of prophet of the church in his Doctrines and Salvations, Volume 1. Quote, There is a reason why one man is born black and with other disadvantages, while another is born white with great advantages. The reason is that we once had an estate before we came here and were obedient, more or less, to the laws that were given us there. Those who were faithful in all things there received greater blessings here, and those who were not faithful received less. End quote. Now, the colloquial phrase I've heard black people referred to in the church is fence sitters. The idea behind this is the claim that there was this huge schism in heaven, you know, when Satan defected and took the host of heaven with him, and these were the third that were just inherently evil or sinners in the pre-mortal existence, right? The rest of us decided to come to earth and receive bodies, but there were some of us who weren't sure if they wanted to go with Satan or Jesus, uh, or, or, you know, they were sinning in the pre-mortal existence or whatever the case was, and they're referred to as fence sitters. These people were given the curse of the black skin because, according to Joseph Fielding Smith and Orson Hyde, they were less faithful and therefore received the lesser hand dealt. Now, (laughs) hopefully you're hanging in there with me because we've only begun to scratch the surface here. One thing worth pointing out, most of the quotes I'm taking are from prophets and presidents of the church. And it can be argued that they were just racist and didn't really reflect the true will of God. But, you know, luckily, we have another quote from another prophet addressing that very concern. And this was said by Wilford Woodruff, the same prophet that denied Jane Manning having access to the Celestial Kingdom. And he said it in his uh, Doctrine and Covenants official declaration number one, quote, The Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. It is not in the program. It is not in the mind of God. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place. And so he will with any other man who attempts to lead the children of men astray from the oracles of God and from their duty. End quote. So this man, Wilford Woodruff, was speaking in the capacity of prophet of God as the Lord's own mouthpiece, and he he said that if he or any other prophet leads the members astray, then they will be removed from their position of power, a statement which was canonized as official Mormon doctrine in the official declaration number one. There's simply no argument to be made claiming that the priesthood ban was from racist men and not from God. So, for the sake of studying this topic, let's grant that. Let's grant the official declaration number one and say that if any prophet ever led the church astray from God's will, they were cut off or removed from their office. That means all Mormon doctrine comes from divine providence and intervention. 
If we're talking about the divine will of the divine God, why was the priesthood ban put in place to devastate generations of black Mormons, only to be lifted away at some arbitrary time later? I mean, what what could possibly have changed God's mind on this highly controversial point of Mormon doctrine? Well, for the answers to those questions, it requires looking further ahead of the timeline than Brigham Young or Wilford Woodruff's time as president and prophet of the church, which we'll discuss momentarily. But it all comes down to one major question. Was the priesthood ban considered doctrine, and thus the divine will of God? If it was true doctrine, then it implies that the ban was passed down from God to the leaders of the church to be instated for some holy purpose that's apparently beyond our reasoning. But if it wasn't true doctrine, it means that the ban was merely put in place by racist men and continued to be perpetuated by racist men for generations, which had nothing to do with God's true will, and thus these men should have been removed before they made these mistakes or led the members astray, right? If the LDS church is indeed the true church, then any doctrine would be irrefutable truth. And the prophets couldn't pass anything down as doctrine unless it were truth handed to them by God. I mean, as stated by Wilford Woodruff earlier, he explicitly states that if any prophet leads the church astray with false doctrine, then he'll be removed from his office as president of the church. So, was the priesthood ban considered doctrine and passed down from God? On July 17, 1947, the church presidency wrote a letter to a Dr. Lowry Nelson that seems to describe exactly what we're looking for. This is from a letter by the church presidency. Quote, From the days of the prophet Joseph Smith, even until now, it has been the doctrine of the church, never questioned by church leaders, that the Negroes are not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel, end quote. Well, there it is. It's said explicitly that Negroes are not supposed to have the priesthood as a matter of doctrine. There's no refuting that, right? And it said it because they're not entitled to the full blessings of the gospel. It's a bit hard to argue that this was not considered doctrine according to this letter written by the presidency of the church, but they dig in even deeper with a public statement released only two years later on August 17, 1949. Quote, The attitude of the church with reference to Negroes remains as it always stood. It is not a matter of the declaration of a policy, but of direct commandment from the Lord, on which is founded the doctrine of the church from the days of its organization, to the effect that Negroes may become members of the church, but that they are not entitled to the priesthood at the present time. End quote. That was a public statement made by the church presidency explicitly telling us that the priesthood ban wasn't a matter of policy, but, quote, a direct commandment from the Lord on which was founded the doctrine of the church. There's simply no foot to stand on when a person claims that blacks not getting the priesthood wasn't actually doctrine of the church. If this is the one true church following the true tenets of the one true God, then God is a very racist individual, even though he was the one who made these people with black skin in the first place. So, I mean, let's let's really get into this. Since Brigham Young made that decree that we read earlier in 1852 that, you know, no person bearing the mark of Cain can have the priesthood until all others have received their blessings, racism has pervaded the ranks of Mormon leadership. It's amazing to me that the founding prophet of the church, Joseph Smith, could be relatively tolerant and progressive for his day when it came to racism, and yet the vast majority of church leadership from Brigham Young on has been rather intolerant and conservative in their thoughts on racism. Now, let me provide a few examples in chronological order as best as I could tell. This is going to be a long string of quote reading, but it's worth it, and there's a point that I'm trying to make here. This is from Brigham Young, the Journal of Discourses, Volume 7, quote, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so, end quote. Here's another quote from Brigham Young. 
Journal of Discourses, Volume 7, page 290 to 291. Quote, You see some classes of the human family that are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild, and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of the intelligent that is generally bestowed upon mankind. I think he's implying just white people there. The Lord put a mark upon Cain, which is the flat nose and black skin. Trace mankind down to after the flood, and then another curse is pronounced upon the same race, that they should be the servant of servants, and they will be until that curse is removed, and the abolitionists cannot help it, nor in the least alter that decree, end quote. He's, uh, you know, Brigham Young taking a swing at the abolitionists there. Now, this uh, next quote goes on to John Taylor, who became the third prophet of the church. This is taken out of the Journal of Discourses, volume 22, page 304. Quote, After the flood, we are told that the curse that had been pronounced upon Cain was continued through Ham's wife, as he had married a wife of that seed. And why did it pass through the flood? Because it was necessary that the devil should have a representative upon the earth as well as God. End quote. Okay, so John Taylor there is asserting that the only reason that uh, the curse of Cain was able to pass through the flood through Ham's wife was because the devil needed to have a representative as well as God have a representative on the earth. Um, if this is God's plan, it's a, a kind of a twisted plan. I, I hope you understand where I'm coming from on this. Yeah. You know, there's, I'm going to take a little sidetrack here to explain the next couple of quotes, but many people aren't aware of this, um, but Utah was a slave territory during its early settlement. Now, while there is no evidence to suggest that Brigham Young himself owned any slaves, this is an interview for a newspaper article that was conducted by a man named Horace Greeley for the New York Tribune on August 20th, 1859, and it's in question and answer format. Quote, Question. What is the position of your church with respect to slavery? Answer. We consider it of divine institution and not to be abolished until the curse pronounced on him shall have been removed from his descendants. Question. Are any slaves now held in this territory? Answer. There are. Question. Do your territorial laws uphold slavery? Answer. Those laws are printed. You can read for yourself. If slaves are brought here by those who owned them in the States, we do not favor their escape from the service of those owners, end quote. So that is what this guy did. Horace Greeley, he was, um, you know, interested in Mormonism and in Brigham Young in 1859, you know, right before the Civil War kicked off and uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and, um, you know, the slavery war basically happened in America. So he came out to uh, to interview Brigham Young, and that's the interview that we just read. But the problem is, you know, after this, Horace Greeley, the guy that conducted the interview, he went on a smear campaign against the church. And he went back to the New York Tribune and published the article and continued, uh, you know, exactly that, a smear campaign against the church. And he uh, he really drew the ire of a lot of people in the church, uh, primarily John Taylor and Brigham Young. Um, so the next quote that we're going to read is from John Taylor in response to, uh, to Horace Greeley. This is taken from the Journal of Discourses, an uh, official Mormon church publication. Quote, This Greeley is one of their popular characters in the East, and one that supports the stealing of niggers and the Underground Railroad. I speak of him because he is one of the prominent newspaper editors of the Eastern country, and he is a poor miserable curse, end quote. So that is what John Taylor's response was to this, this smear campaign that um, Horace Greeley was on to try and expose the racism in, in Mormonism and, you know, try and understand why the Utah Territory elected to be a slave territory. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised, I guess. It's, it's just, it's offensive. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that's that's from the third prophet of the church, John Taylor. Just just keep that in mind, everybody. So to to kind of clarify this up, Utah was a territory until it gained statehood in 1896. Now, upon the granting of statehood to California in the Compromise of 1850. California was declared a free state, while the territories of New Mexico and Utah were given sovereignty to decide whether or not they would have slaves granted by a majority of vote. New Mexico elected to be a free state, Utah a slave state. 
So slavery was alive and well in Utah until being abolished in 1863 and probably some time after that. There were actually three black slave members of the first wagon train to settle Utah in 1847. There were three slaves there. And these slaves were sent ahead to essentially pave the way for their masters that would cross the plains soon after them. These men were named Oscar Crosby. <laughs> these, it's like it's like slappy or something. It's, these are just such you know typical what you would expect to be 19th century black slave names. It's amazing. Oscar Crosby, Hark Lay, and Green Flake. <laughs> amazing. I love the name so much. But Green Flake was actually the most interesting one of the bunch for the simple fact that he was given to the church as tithing. Uh, yes, yes, Green Flake was given as tithing. What happened is his master died in 1850, and the widow of his master gave Green Flake to Brigham Young as tithing. After two years of slavery to Brigham Young and the church, Flake was given his freedom. <laughs> That's something hidden deep in the annals of Utah history. The fact that a black slave was given to the church as a tithing debt. You wonder if they'd accept that now. During the census before 1860, hundreds of black and Native American slaves were listed in the Utah Territory, leaving a permanent black mark on Utah's history. You know, pardon the pun. But the next quote, um, back on track here, the next quote that we're going to read is uh, in into the 19th century, and it's from B.H. Roberts. I believe it was given uh, in the 1910s. And this is uh, from his The 70s Course on Theology. Quote, that the Negro is markedly inferior to the Caucasian is proved both craniologically and by 6,000 years of planet-wide experimentation, end quote. So, I mean... Ignoring the fact that he's embracing, you know, the the six thousand year um, model for the the church, which I think plenty of Mormons still espouse today, even though we're you know more than a century after this quote was given, he's uh, you know Roberts here is asserting that um, obviously the Negroes were inferior to the Caucasians because their brains were apparently smaller, and uh, you know six thousand years of planet wide experimentation has proven that they're uh, you know just an inferior species, basically. Um, whew. Offensive, offensive, offensive stuff. All right, here. Uh, we're going to Melvin J. Ballard. I, I couldn't find the date for when this was given. He says, quote, of the thousands of children born today, a certain proportion of them went to the Hottentots of the South Sea. Thousands went to Negro mothers, thousands to beautiful white Latter-day Saint mothers, end quote. So that's where he's talking, uh, you know, Ballard here in this case is embracing the idea of, uh, you know, the pre-mortal existence kind of determines, you know, uh, where you're going to be born and the type of life that you're going to have, which is, you know, disgustingly racist in and of itself. It, it, but it's embracing Mormon doctrine. And we've argued up to this point and given a lot of evidence for the fact that it was considered Mormon doctrine. The next quote is from Bruce R. McConkie. Um, probably one of the most controversial apostles in the church ever. And this is taken from his book, Mormon Doctrine. There's that word again, Mormon Doctrine, pages 107 to 108. Quote, in a broad general sense, caste systems have their origin in the gospel itself. And when they operate according to the divine decree, the resultant restrictions and segregation are right and proper and have the approval of the Lord. To illustrate, Cain, Ham, and the whole Negro race have been cursed with a black skin, the mark of Cain, so that they can be identified as a caste apart, a people with whom the other descendants of Adam should not intermarry, end quote. That's from 1954, all right? So he's advocating a caste system, which, you know, still exists in, in you know, very Hindi parts of uh India and there are very big problems with caste systems of you know people of upper castes just beating people of lower castes and you know just the uh, the caste system goes hand in hand part and parcel with the income inequality that is in India and it's a very disgusting thing it takes a very quick google search to see videos of people being beat just because they're from a lower caste and you know, that's what Bruce R. McConkie is advocating. And this is in the 20th century. This is in the middle of the 20th century. 
The next quote is from Joseph Fielding Smith out of his essay, Doctrines of Salvation. There's that word again, Doctrines of Salvation, page 65 through 66. Quote, there were no neutrals in the war in heaven. All took sides either with Christ or with Satan. Every man had his agency there, and men receive rewards here based upon their actions there, just as they will receive rewards hereafter for deeds done in the body. The Negro, evidently, is receiving the reward he merits, end quote. That was from the mid-1950s as well. Just embracing the idea that there's, you know, scriptural justification for the war in heaven and as and obviously there were people that did certain things that received rewards here, you know, uh, you know, on the mortal existence, they received rewards from their actions as the pre-mortal existence. And he's pointing at, you know, how horrible it was to be a black person in the 1950s and justifying it saying, well, obviously they were sinners before they were born. So, you know, (laughs) Everybody is uh, everybody is reaping the rewards of their actions in the premortal existence. I mean, it is kind of similar to like you know a reincarnation or something to that effect. It's just a a limited reincarnation, from what I can tell. So uh, the next quote is from the Church and the Negro, page forty two. I couldn't find a date for this, but it's an official church publication. Quote. It is the Mormon belief that in our pre-mortal state, there were a large number of individuals who, due to some act or behavior of their own in the pre-existence, forfeited the right to hold the priesthood during their mortal lives. The Negro is thus denied the priesthood because of his own behavior in the pre-existence. End quote. I mean... I've reiterated it a couple of times. It's just, you know, more assertions that this is doctrine. This is true church doctrine here. Um, Here's another quote from Bruce R. McConkie's book of the uh, Mormon Doctrine, 1954. Quote, Negroes in this life are denied the priesthood. Under no circumstances can they hold this delegation of authority from the Almighty. The gospel message of salvation is not carried affirmatively to them. Negroes are not equal with other races where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned, end quote. I mean, I, I, it, yeah, I, there's not much to say on it. It's just so nastily racist. It's just disgusting. So the next quote, it, it sickens me even more because this is from the Juvenile Instructor, which was a church magazine in the 1950s and 60s, I believe. Now, the equivalent of this is the New Era today. That's the current church's magazine, and it's geared towards a younger audience, towards, um, you know, anybody up to about the age of 16. So that's what the Juvenile Instructor was at this time. And this is a quote from that Juvenile Instructor aimed towards kids. Now tell me if this sounds like brainwashing or indoctrination. Quote, The last in order stands the Negro race, the lowest in intelligence and the most barbarous of all children of men. It is very clear that the mark which was set upon the descendants of Cain was a skin of blackness. It has been noticed in our day that men who have lost the spirit of the Lord and from whom his blessings have been withdrawn have turned dark to such an extent as to excite the comments of all who have known them, end quote. <laughs> they were teaching that to children. I have nothing else to say about that. But now we move on to a few quotes from a very important person in 1978. Mark E. Peterson was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles during this time that we're discussing in the 1970s. He was known to be one of the more racist of the brethren, and thus the vote to allow blacks the priesthood was held when Mark E. Peterson was in another country. So, you know, the the thing is, why that's important is any revelation or anything like this that comes down that allows blacks the priesthood, it had to be done by a unanimous vote of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the Presidency. So they knew that Marky e. Peterson was never going to agree to it, so they held the vote while he was in South America. Amazing. Amazing. But we'll get to that, uh, to details of that, you know, pretty soon here. Um, but we're going to read a few quotes from him. Um two really good ones and then one that's really long, but I'm going to, you know, kind of punctuate it with my own commentary. And, you know, there's just a lot of really good information here. So this is Mark E. Peterson um, 
All of these are taken from his essay, Race Problems as They Affect the Church, published in 1954. Quote, Think of the Negro, cursed as to the priesthood. This Negro, who, in the pre-existence, lived the type of life which justified the Lord in sending him to the earth in their lineage of Cain with a black skin, and possibly being born in darkest Africa. If that Negro is willing, when he hears the gospel to accept it, he may have many of the blessings of the gospel, in spite of all he did in the pre-existent life. The Lord is willing. If the Negro accepts the gospel with real, sincere faith and is really converted to give him the blessings of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost, if that Negro is faithful all his days, he can and will enter the celestial kingdom. He will go there as a servant, but he will get celestial glory, end quote. <laughs> kind of like Jane Manning did when she was sealed to Joseph and Emma, she was sealed as their eternal slave. And that's exactly what Marquis e. Peterson is talking about with the race problems as they affect the church in his essay here. No matter how faithful uh, you know, a black person is, the utmost, the ultimate glory that they can reach is being a servant in the celestial kingdom, an eternal slave. Black people, you want to join the church? <laughs> anyway, let's go on to his next quote. Marky Peterson, this is uh, still from Race Problem 1954. No person having the least particle of Negro blood can hold the priesthood. It does not matter if they are one-sixth Negro or one-hundred-and-sixth. The curse of no priesthood is the same. If an individual who is entitled to the priesthood marries a Negro, the Lord has decreed that only spirits who are not eligible to the priesthood will come to that marriage as children. To intermarry with a Negro is to forfeit a nation of priesthood holders, end quote. <laughs> so he said, it doesn't matter how much of a black person you are, how, you know, what percentage of, 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 you know, black blood you have in you, basically. Um, if you marry with somebody that is, you know, uh, you could be the most righteous white and delightsome person. If you marry a person that has a single drop of Negro blood, he said it, not me. He said it. Then you, uh, you, you basically, um, you forfeit a nation of priesthood holders. Everybody that's descended from that marriage uh, can't hold the priesthood. So, um, yeah, that's really, really horrible. But, um, you know, it's, it's this idea of, you know, a nation dwindling unbelief from the sins of one man, and, you know, this is the crux of their arguments in 1954. It was, you know, not wanting segregation and not wanting intermarriage. Um, but I think uh, the next quote we're going to read from Marky e. Peterson really embodies that. And, um, you know, we're, we're really going to dive into this. And I, I'm going to be stopping occasionally through it because it's a little bit longer, but it's really, really important and chock full of important information here. Quote, the discussion on civil rights, especially over the last 20 years, has drawn some very sharp lines. It has blinded the thinking of some of our own people, I believe. They have allowed their political affiliations to color their thinking to some extent. And then, of course, they have been persuaded by some of the arguments that have been put forth. We who teach in the church certainly must have our feet on the ground and not be led astray by the philosophies of men on this subject. All right, so at the onset right here, he's talking about, uh, you know, people are adjusting their beliefs about, you know, black people based on their political affiliations and whatnot. And he's saying we need to be firmly grounded in uh, doctrine and in our religious beliefs and not allow you know, black people to assimilate. And, you know, it, that's, I'm just going to keep reading because he really, really does a good job of it here. Uh, he goes on to say, quote, I think I have read enough to give you an idea of what the Negro is after. He is not just seeking the opportunity of sitting down in a cafe where white people eat. He isn't just trying to ride on the same streetcar or the same Pullman car with white people. It isn't that he just desires to go to the same theater as white people. From this and other interviews I have read, it appears that the Negro seeks absorption with the white race. He will not be satisfied until he achieves it by intermarriage. This is his objective, and we must face it. We must not allow our feelings to carry us away. 
nor must we feel so sorry for Negroes that we will open our arms and embrace them with everything we have. This is fear-mongering and xenophobic nastiness. Ah, oh, it's, it's so offensive. And uh, he, he digs in even deeper here. Now let's talk about segregation again for a few moments. Now remember, this was, um, I think this was only published a, a month or a couple of months after Brown v. Board of Education came out that, you know, basically termed segregation in schools illegal. And that's when, you know, segregation all over in restaurants and movie theaters and buses were, that's when it all came into question. And this was Marky e. Peterson's response to that, that ruling, basically. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, uh, let me continue here. He says, now let's talk about segregation again for a few moments. Was segregation a wrong principle when the Lord chose the nations to which the spirits were to come, determining that some would be Japanese and some would be Chinese and some Negroes and some Americans. He engaged in an act of segregation. <laughs> there you go. So he's saying that God segregated all of the people by their nations. So it's, you know, obviously God is great with segregation. He loves it. He goes on to say, when he, meaning the Lord, told Enoch not to preach the gospel to the descendants of Cain who were black, the Lord engaged in segregation. I agree. When he cursed the descendants of Cain as to the priesthood, he engaged in segregation. Yes, you are correct, Marky e. Peterson. That's horrible, but it's correct. Who placed the Negroes originally in darkest Africa? Was it some man or was it God? And when he placed them there, he segregated them. The Lord segregated the people both as to blood and place of residence. At least in the cases of the Lamanites and the Negro, we have the definite word of the Lord himself that he placed a dark skin upon them as a curse, as a punishment, and as a sign to all others. <laughs> it's just so offensive. I, I feel like I've said that too many times already, but it's just so horrible. I can't believe this guy was an apostle of God. Oh, man. All right. He goes on to say, he forbade intermarriage with them under the threat of extension of the curse. And he certainly segregated the descendants of Cain when he cursed the Negro as to the priesthood and drew an absolute line. You may even say he dropped an iron curtain there. <laughs> oh, I love that. So not only is he, you know, preaching this fear mongering and is he's saying that segregation is all right because God did segregation when he put the people on the planet, which, you know, that's a sound ar argument. I can't argue with it. Um, it's internally logical, at least. But, uh, you know, it, it does imply that God is racist, even though he created all of these people with, with their different skin colors and different languages in the first place. So, you know, that's a little confusing in and of himself. But then he even brings in the word Iron Curtain there. And this was in the mid-1950s during the Red Scare. And, uh, it, you know, it was fear-mongering at its best. It's, he's like... He was like, uh, you know, a 1950s version of like Brian Fisher or like Alex Jones or something like drawing things together and using these punch words that people were scared of, like Iron Curtain thinking, oh, that's what the communists want us to have as an Iron Curtain, just like they do over there in the communist Russia. And, you know, it's just absolutely amusing that he's he's pulling these things together. But I'm not surprised. It's a modus operandi of a lot of uh, religious leaders in this. So um, <laughs> the next line is really, really astonishing um, because after he went on this huge diatribe of fear mongering and telling us how cursed black people are and how evil the Negro is and how God segregated the Negroes from the Chinese, from the Japanese, from the Americans. Um, he goes on to say, now we are generous with the Negro. <laughs> Given everything you said up to this point, I don't necessarily agree with you. Uh, <laughs> he really digs in here. We are willing that the Negro have the highest education. I would be willing to let every Negro drive a Cadillac <laughs> if they could afford it. <laughs> wow. I would be willing that they have all the advantages they can get out of life in this world. <laughs> but let them enjoy these things among themselves. <laughs> I think the Lord segregated the Negro, and who is a man to change that segregation? 
It reminds me of the scripture on marriage. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Only here we have the reverse of the thing. What God hath separated, let not man bring together again. End quote. Wow. <laughs> so, it's this idea where, you know, segregation attempted to, you know, say separate but equal, right? And it completely failed um, in housing, in economy, in education, in so many aspects. Well, in pretty much all aspects of the black colonies and the white colonies, uh, you know, white, black cities and white cities. And, um, you know, even in Missouri, in Missouri, you know, during this time, they had what were called the, the Negro blocks. And that, that's what they were, is they were just basically what we would call today, like, the ghetto or the hood, where they they have relegated black people to only live here. And they say, oh, well, these people, you know, they have all the advantages that all white people do. You know, it's just, it's a matter of seizing those advantages. And it's it's completely wrong. It's It's a very ignorant perspective of what separate but equal is. And now, just on a personal note, and we have a couple more quotes to read here, and we'll get to them in a second. But on a personal note, I remember when I was speaking with somebody in uh, in Nebraska. On you know, I I used to do a job where I I drove out to southwestern Nebraska, and uh, she was a very nice lady. Um, but you know, she did hold on to some ideals that I didn't necessarily agree with. And we got talking about um the Ferguson riots that were happening, and she talked about you know, oh well, all of those thugs are just you know drug dealers and they're, you know, they're doing all these things and all this crime and everything, you know, it's just, you know, I, I just wish they wouldn't do it. You know, they're probably just always going to do it, but I wish they wouldn't do it. So we should, we should put them in a place where, you know, they can all just do that. And, you know, they, they, they can't come out into the world and, you know, and do the gangbanging and stuff where us civilized people are. And, you know, I, I didn't want to say anything because this was a customer and I couldn't argue very much or anything, but, um, you know, I, I talked to her and I'm like, yeah, you know, that is a great idea. If we could, you know, just put all gang members in one place and just let them fight it out and, you know, not have to worry about it, you know, and they'll have all of the advantages that white people have too, you know, they'll just be completely separate, but equal because that worked. And that, that, that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> it's like, prohibition, right? Uh, we tried to outlaw alcohol consumption, but it just made it worse and created crime. And same thing with, you know, separate but equal. We tried it as a society. We tried to separate ourselves along racial lines and it didn't work. It just created crime. And now we're still living with the effects of that, the after effects of this racism and this segregation. Uh, I mean, look at Ferguson. It's a very, very African-American area and the policing practices there reflect, uh, well, antiquated and racist ideas and, and practices by the policing force. And I, I know a lot of people probably won't agree with me on this, but it's just what I've observed and what I've learned from, uh, from what I've read about it. And from, uh, looking at the numbers, the, the population statistics of Ferguson, um, well, it blows, it blows my mind. And I feel like it was the beginning of, uh, of a change. I think it was the first of many, but uh, we'll, we'll see. That's a completely separate topic, but it does kind of relate into what, you know, what Marky Peterson is saying here is, you know, we, we can allow all of the black people to have, you know, all of the advantages and all of the opportunities that white people can have, you know, they just have to do it in their own place. They have to do it in their own segregated world, just like God intended. That's why God put them on a different country to start with. So it's so, so bitterly offensive and it just blows my mind. But the, um, the last quote in this string of quotes that we're going to read here, you know, there, there's a couple other quotes later on, but the last one that we're going to read out of this string is actually from Spencer W. Kimball. Now, why this was important is because Mark E. Peterson was an apostle at the time that, um, the, the priesthood ban was lifted in 1978, and we discussed the, the details a little bit of what was going on and how he was in a different country. But Spencer W. Kimball was actually the prophet at the time. But he released an article in the Improvement Era on December uh, in December 1960. This is page 922 and 923. And he, uh, he was an apostle at this time. He wasn't the prophet, of course. Quote, I saw a striking contrast in the progress of an Indian people today. The day of the Lamanites is nigh. For years they have been growing delightsome, and they are now becoming white and delightsome as they were promised. 
In this picture of the 20 Lamanite missionaries, 15 of the 20 were as white as Anglos. Five were darker, but equally delightsome. The children in the home of the placement program in Utah are often lighter than their brothers and sisters and the Hogans on the same reservation. At one meeting, a father and mother and their 16-year-old daughter were present. The little member girl, 16, is sitting between the dark father and mother, and it was evident she was several shades lighter than her parents. On the same reservation, in the same Hogan, subject to the same sun and wind and weather. These young members of the church are changing to whiteness and delightsomeness. One elder jokingly said that he and his companion were donating blood regularly to the hospital in the hope that the process might be accelerated, end quote. <laughs> wow, that was horrible. So that's Spencer W. Kimball, and he is embracing the idea of skin color and righteousness being directly related. He was, he's asserting here that he has a picture of a, a whole bunch of uh, Lamanites, you know, um, Indians, Native Americans, and he's showing how the ones that have been in the church placement program are whiter and more delightsome than their parents, which obviously shows that they're more righteous. Um, I don't know the details of it. I don't even want to speculate. Maybe those kids were just indoors more often than their parents because they were, you know, sitting inside and learning the scriptures and going to seminary and whatnot uh, while their parents were still out working the fields like Native Americans frequently did in the 1960s. I mean, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know the details and I don't feel comfortable speculating on it, but it's really horrible to assert this with such confidence and say, we are seeing the, you know, the progression of people that are, you know, going from dark and loathsome to white and delightsome. And we see it just in one generation from parents to a, a more righteous daughter. So, um, yeah, and then, and then one one step beyond that, uh, he says one white elder jokingly said that he he and his companion were donating blood regularly in hopes that they could accelerate the process of becoming white and delightsome. They were hoping that hey, you know, I'm a good white Mormon boy. I'm gonna go donate blood. So hopefully they'll give my blood to a black person or a Native American, and hopefully. The the process of them becoming more white and delightsome will be accelerated. Ooh, wow, we're talking about things in uh, in the last century. This was happening in the twentieth century. This happened barely more than half a century ago. This was in nineteen sixty that this statement was made by Spencer W. Kimball. I mean, it's just so amazing, and you know. <laughs> There, there does seem to be a lot that we can take away from, you know, all of these various quotes. I, I know there was a lot of them, but that was kind of the point. We can see from the inception of Utah Mormonism under Joseph Smith that racism has been a central tenet and doctrine of Mormonism. There were even a few quotes stating that the priesthood ban will always be in place and will never be removed, spoken from the mouths of prophets that if we understand and agree with what Wilford Woodruff said, that they should have been removed from their office if they ever led the church and its members astray. Now, trust me, this was by no means cherry-picking quotes out of context or something. If you want to lose your faith in humanity, do a Google search for racist Mormon quotes. That's how I started the research for this podcast, and you can spend hours reading all of the literature available for it. I mean, I know that I just read a lot of quotes in a row, but that was the point of it. A person can argue that racism may have been a church doctrine, but of course the people weren't necessarily racist. But when you have this many quotes that I picked out of hundreds of others that were just as offensive, that argument tends to fall apart. There's simply no shortage of racist quotes from Mormon church leaders, and I can't stress that point enough. Not only was racism a doctrine of the church, but it was defended by racist men using racist arguments and logic to defend it. There were so many quotes that didn't make the cut, but were just as xenophobic and racist as the ones we just read. And I encourage anybody that's wanting to know more about this to just simply look that up. There's no shortage of racism in Mormon history. 
The argument can't even be made that maybe some leaders felt that way, but it wasn't church policy. These were racist doctrines put in place by racist white men. End of story. But not really the end of the story because we're only halfway through the podcast. The one main question that sits on my mind concerning all this information that we've covered so far is what would change the church's hard stance on this racism? You know, what was it that incited such a polar shift in the paradigm of racism that plagued the church for over a century and a half up to the, that point in 1978? I mean, we, we know that the vast majority of revelations given by the church were done in a time of specific need, right? If we look back to the countless revelations given by Joseph Smith about tithing and, you know, members giving their possessions to the church, we see that those revelations were given during a time that the church was bleeding money and nearly bankrupt. And there was a necessity for that revelation. If we look at like, you know, the word of wisdom revelation, it was only given after Emma Smith, Joseph's wife, complained about having to clean up the spittoons in the school of the elders. And, you know, that that was what necessitated the revelation of the word of wisdom. I mean, such is the nature of a revelation-driven church like Mormonism. So what created the necessity for the church to finally give the priesthood to black people? Or just anybody marked with the seed of Cain? Now, while we can never know the inner workings of church leadership, nor can we truly assign motives to such revelations, maybe there is something hidden in these social and political pressures that forced the leadership to come up with such a revelation, allowing blacks to have the priesthood. That last quote that we read from Spencer W. Kimball was in 1960, during the largest time of social unrest regarding racism. I mean, that was, that was nationwide. It was everywhere. The Black Panthers were only half a decade away from being organized when that last quote was issued. And this next quote that we're going to read is an excerpt from December 15th, 1969. It was a statement made by the church. And this was only nine years after the last quote that we read by Spencer Kimball, and only three years after the Black Panthers were organized. It was a first presidency statement issued to two general authorities, regional representatives of the Twelve Apostles, stake presidents, mission presidents, and bishops. So this statement went through all of the lines of authority in the church. Everybody read this, and they read it in their congregations. It said, quote, From the beginning of this dispensation, Joseph Smith and all succeeding presidents of the church have taught that Negroes, while spirit children of a common father and the progeny of our earthly parents, Adam and Eve, were not yet to receive the priesthood. For reasons which we believe are known to God, but which he has not made fully known to man. End quote. All right. Did you notice the shift there? Every single quote that we've read up to this point was issued in 1960 or earlier, and all of them use some form of scriptural or doctrinal basis to explain the priesthood ban. They all said something about the premortal existence or something about the the seed of Cain being cursed through Ham and through the the flood and being preserved and you know God needing or Satan needing a representative here just as well as God. I mean, there was very very strict doctrinal or scriptural basis for everything that they claimed given the priesthood ban. But not in this one. This was the first official church statement that claimed anything along the lines of the ban being God's idea and us not knowing why. It said that right at the end, for reasons which we believe are known to God, but which he has not made fully known to man. This was the first time that they said that. Given everything we've discussed up to this point, it seems hard to believe that they just forgot all of the justifications that had been used and canonized as doctrine up to this point that seemed to justify or explain the priesthood ban. I mean, well, we know that the political group, the Black Panthers, had risen to social prominence as what was all over the headlines by the time that this 1969 release was issued. And racial segregation was a hot button topic for anybody that was engaged in politics. And the church was no different. They were part of it. They were in the middle. This is the beginning of the turn. This statement right here, December 15th, 1969, marked the beginning of the end for the priesthood ban for anybody marked with the seed of Cain. So let's see how it progressed from there. We're trying to take this chronologically and see what we can find out. 
David O. McKay is one of the lesser discussed prophets in the church, but he was an integral part in drawing a line between African blacks and any other races of people that had the mark of Cain. He said this explicitly before his death in 1970 that the priesthood man only includes those of African descent, whereas any Pacific Islanders or Australian Aborigines or Fijians could hold the priesthood. He also decreed that any man of South African descent didn't need to prove his lineage in order to attain the priesthood. I mean, I suppose that's because South Africans often aren't quite as dark and loathsome as other more Central Africans are, but I mean, I'm not really sure why he drew the line there. So, you know, we're really beginning to see the hard line against blacks holding the priesthood soften as racial tensions were mounting in America and elsewhere. After David O. McKay drew these lines, you know, kind of relegating the priesthood ban to anybody of black mid-African descent in the very late 1960s, the biggest problem arose for the church. In 1975, the leadership of the church announced that it would build a temple in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This created problems because temples are constructed for, you know, those local members of the church in that local area where the temple's being built. But the vast majority of the locals around this temple plot were marked as descendants of Cain. This meant if the church built the temple in Brazil with the priesthood ban in place, not only would nobody be able to work in the temple, or they just wouldn't even be able to attend it or go because they were all banned by this antiquated doctrine. This wasn't the only problem, because when a temple is announced in any given area, the church encourages the members of that area to become temple-worthy. I, I mean, I just saw this happen in Fort Collins with their temple. I mean, this is, you know, a necessary tenet of a person becoming temple-worthy is paying their tithing. So this forces a lot of members to go get temple recommends, which requires them to meet with their bishops and catch up on any back tithing that they haven't paid up on, which creates a groundswell of funding wherever that temple is being constructed. Well, if the vast majority of the members in the Sao Paulo area couldn't attend the temple, they probably weren't going to renew their temple recommends, meaning that the church would be short on funding for the construction of said Brazilian temple. So this was a double whammy of unfortunate outcomes of the priesthood ban that largely affected the construction of this temple. So not wanting their temple to go bankrupt and, you know, actually wanting people to attend the church ceremonies, those were two very large pressures that were mounting to help push the church to lift the ban on blacks with the priesthood. Then we get to the BYU sports department. The only way to describe BYU is it's basically the apple of the eye of the church, right? The church holds Brigham Young University up as its premier educational facility and a large source of income, and no department in BYU holds quite so much reverence as the BYU sports department. As racial tensions were mounting on a national scale and legal segregation was being called out after being made officially illegal in Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, BYU sports teams ran into some very major problems. Now, this is an excerpt from an article that was written in 2005, and it's hosted on universe.byu.edu, titled Racial Issues Heat Up, BYU Accused of Racism, Blacks Get the Priesthood in the 70s. And, and that's the title of it. And of course, there will be a link for it in the show notes. And uh, it's a little bit long, but it really, um, a lot happens. There's a lot happening in this article, and it covers a large swath of time from uh, the late 60s all the way into the mid-70s. So uh, I'm just going to read a, a big chunk out of this article. Quote, In a Sports Illustrated article, author Alexander Wolfe described the athletic atmosphere of the 1960s and 70s as one in which, although open to the idea of integrated schools, many people saw allowing blacks on their football teams as messing with the sacraments. I mean, just to take a side note here, I mean, that's that's what Remember the Titans is all about, right? I mean, they were some of the earliest um, integrated football teams, and they, they, were, they were having, you know, they dealt with so much racism, and it was just horrible that people were, um, you know, opposed to black people being on white football teams or white basketball teams. And the Mormon church was, um, you know, it, it had something beyond that. It wasn't just the racism, but it was also messing with the sacraments, he says in quotes. Um, 
you know, it, or messing with the doctrine of the church. So the article goes on to say, Trailblazers at major universities all over the South endured on-field cheap shots, racial slurs from fans, and hate mail and abusive phone calls in their dorms, the article states. On the West Coast, however, the Western Athletic Conference was caught in its own racial war, and BYU was not immune to topics of racial debate and protests by opposing teams within the conference. Although many students at BYU didn't see what the big deal was, web and game program coordinator for BYU Athletics, Ralph Zobel, said several universities picketed and protested against the university because of its perceived racism. 14 University of Wyoming football players in 1969, later called the Black 14, wanted to wear armbands protesting alleged racial policies at BYU. So th this was what came to be known as the Black 14, like I said. Um, they were 14 University of Wyoming football players that said, hey, we're not going to deal with this. We're going to wear armbands, um, I, I think kind of in a symbolic way of, uh, you know, drawing a line between it and, you know, maybe some, what had happened 30 years earlier in, in Germany. So I think that's where they were, they were coming up with this armband here or Maybe that was just one way to identify those 14 players out of the, the football team. Um, but in any case, uh, the article goes on to say, because of a policy set in place by Coach Lloyd Eaton that prohibited players from protesting, the football players were suspended. So that's what happened to these black 14. They were protesting, you know, they, they were these black players, football players, protesting the racist policies of the Mormon church and BYU. And their coach, uh, Lloyd Eaton, the coach of the University of Wyoming football team, suspended them because of the protest. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty horrible. Uh, the article goes on. Zobel, who was a student at Wyoming at the time, said, although most students were curious, some members of the university's black student union demonstrated at church buildings. Now, this is quoting Zobel, quote, they picketed the Church Institute of Religion. I remember going to priesthood meeting and having to cross a picket line, and they videotaped me as I went into church. End quote. Back to quoting the article. Negative feelings towards the church and BYU were the impetus behind the church sending to Wyoming, then BYU spokesman Heber Wolsey, to dispel myths about the church. All right, so this is one of our heavy hitters. We have Heber Wolsey, who was a spokesman for BYU. When all of these picketings were happening and these these various sports teams were boycotting BYU, he was the guy that was tasked with going to these various schools and giving lectures and saying, hey, we're totally not racist. You know, why are you protesting us? You know, it's just we should all live and let live and be cool. Um, but but Wolsey wasn't enough because he was a white guy. Uh, so he was a white guy justifying racism to these sports teams and they weren't OK with it. Um, but the article goes on to say, Wolsey said, explaining that there were black people in the church was a great help to him when trying to allay heightened emotions. When they asked what black person would be a member of the LDS church, Wolsey called up Darius Gray, a member of the LDS church and an employee of KSL TV in Salt Lake City. So the, these are our two main guys. We have Wolsey, who's the white BYU spokesman, and he called Darius Gray, who was at the time attending BYU, I believe, um, Sorry, uh, he was an employee of KSL TV, and we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We'll talk about Darius Gray's story because it's it's really remarkable in and of itself. But the article continues. After explaining the heightened situation at Wyoming, Gray agreed to immediately fly to Wyoming and assist Wolsey in lectures and discussions. This is quoting Wolsey here. Quote: He was a tremendous asset to the church in saying why he was a member. Back to quoting the article. Throughout the 70s, Wolsey traveled throughout the country speaking at several colleges and communities that were concerned about church policies. The University of Arizona in October 1970 sent a six-member fact-finding committee to determine if BYU was racist after they said rhetoric had escalated too far with regards to racism and the Western Athletic Conference. Okay, so... You know, while Wolsey and uh, uh, Gray, Darius Gray, this, uh, you know, black guy, white guy, salt and pepper tag team were going on the speaking circuit to these various schools that were boycotting the BYU, um, you know, the University of Arizona was like, hey, you know, it's hard to parse the reality out of the rhetoric that we're hearing. So we're going to send a six member fact finding committee to BYU to see what we can figure out for ourselves. So, um, 
What happened after that, uh, the, the article continues, the Daily Universe reported that the school's committee determined BYU was not racist, but was, quote, an isolated institution whose members simply do not relate to or understand black people, <laughs> end quote, <laughs> much like uh, Salt Lake City is today still. Um, <laughs> back to the article here. There's only a little bit left here. Quote, the findings were presented on Arizona's campus the same week. Still, when BYU football players showed up at University of Arizona's stadium a week later, they were met by 75 picketers demonstrating against racism at BYU. Stanford and San Jose University both refused to play BYU in any sport because of what they called racism at BYU, end quote. And that was taken from an article that is hosted on BYU's own uh, archives. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say that that was slanted against Mormonism, but I think it lays bare a lot of the things that we need to talk about here. So we'll talk about Wolsey and Darius Gray here in a minute. But, you know, given that article, you know, and like I said, it will be linked in the show notes, we can really begin to see the pressures mounting against the church and their stance on blacks with the priesthood. And, of course, the inherent racism that was implied. Not only were they building a temple that nobody could use in Brazil, but BYU sports teams were being met with picket lines because of this priesthood ban. That group that initially, you know, set these these protests off later came to be known as the Black 14. And being suspended just goes to show that it wasn't the sports department of the schools that were boycotting BYU, but rather the very players themselves. And when these 14 young black men refused to play against BYU, the sports department of their school suspended them for their protest. A lot of higher-ups wanted this whole thing to go away and blow over, but the people at the bottom line were organizing these grassroots protests with the real fear of punishment or suspension from the sports team for doing it. Now, you know, I have to admire that. I have to admire these Black 14 that were able to do this, that actually, you know, had the nuts to do something like this, because it took a lot of gumption to actually protest uh, an entire school sports team, even at the threat of being suspended. Um, you know, it was, it was a grassroots movement. It was the people at the bottom line that were affected the most. It was these, you know, these sports players themselves that were being affected by it, that were organizing the protests and is, you know, the higher ups just wanted the whole thing to go away. So I think that's worth pointing out. So let's go ahead and talk about this man that Wolsey recruited to basically be the token black man spokesperson that was able to make this, you know, public speaking circuit that justified the race ban. So Darius Gray had joined the church a mere eight years before he was recruited to make these speeches at various universities to try and simmer down these racial tensions. He was met with picket lines and protesters himself, even though he was just speaking at many of these schools that he went to. I mean... <laughs> it's ironic because he was the church's answer to these racial pressures and protests that were mounting, but he himself was met with picket lines. I found an article from the Deseret News covering a 2014 interview with Darius, and I'll read a small excerpt from it here in a minute. But the most remarkable thing about the article is when Darius recounts his arrival to Salt Lake City. He said that he walked around downtown Salt Lake City for hours, just seeing the sights and, you know, trying to familiarize himself with the town. But of course, being the only black guy walking around Salt Lake, he was just met with horror filled stares and, you know, people that were appalled at his very existence. And, you know, this is 1965. So I guess that makes sense. But the most amazing part about it is when he saw another black couple in a car stopped at a stop sign. He was so excited to see another black person that he ran up to the car and tapped on the window. And this is how he recounts it from this Deseret News article. Quote, It was June, but the car had air conditioning. The woman rolled down her window part way. Excuse me, Grace said. I'm new here in town. I've been walking around for hours and you're the first black people I've seen. It's so good to see you. The man and woman looked at each other. Then the woman turned back to Gray. She said, we're just passing through. End quote. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. The only black people that he saw for hours and probably for days, uh, they were just passing through town. How could this not be a red flag to him? I mean, try to put yourself there for a minute. 
you arrive in a strange new world that is Salt Lake City, Utah, as a newcomer to the church. You walk around for hours getting the most offensive and abhorrent looks, and when you finally see another black couple, they tell you that they have nothing to do with Utah, they're just passing through and they can't wait to get out. I mean, the article goes on to talk about Gray not being paid for the first job he worked and basically having to sue the owner of the company to get back pay, but all those hardships would soon change. After a few years, he was picked up by a man named Arch Madsen, the owner of KSL at the time, and I'll let Darius tell the rest, which comes from the same Deseret News article. Quote, I gathered enough information to suspect the priesthood restriction was likely of man and not of God, but it was a moving target. You know, I, I can't argue with you there, man. I, I would agree that it was of man and not of God. Some would say a revelation is coming that would give black men the priesthood. Others said it wouldn't come until after the second coming. Others said it wouldn't be until the end of the millennial period. No one had a firm grasp on it. In the late 1960s and early 70s, Gray was moving in elevated circles in Salt Lake City. KSL President Arch Madsen offered Gray a job as a cub reporter in 1966, became a mentor, and later asked Gray to commit to return to BYU and finish a degree. Now, you know, just, just, just let me stop there for a second. So Arch Madsen was the owner of KSL, and he was like, hey, there's actually a black person in town. I'm going to option this guy, basically. I'm going to reserve him, give him a job, and he's going to be the public face that can go interview um, you know, Black Panthers. And you know, he can be the, the black guy boots on the ground that can actually, I can actually send to these places and not seem like a racist, right? So uh, it says here that uh, Arch Madison asked gray to return to BYU and finish a degree there. Um, I assume personally, because he wanted, um, gray to be the poster child. He wanted a black person that he could parade around and say, Hey, I'm not racist. Obviously, look, I have a black spokesman. Um, you know, it, it's the same black friend defense that doesn't hold any water in racist circles, but it gets so much deeper than that because, you know, after he got a commitment from Gray to come back and finish a degree at BYU, the article goes on to say, quote, Matson also sent Gray and his wife as stand-ins to dinners and other events around town. Soon, the Grays were rubbing elbows with civic leaders and LDS church leaders. Now, this is quoting Gray directly, quote, Arch opened the world for me. I am and will be grateful, end quote. Now we can really start seeing the chips being moved into place on the board. The church needed a black man that they could put on a pedestal that would give public lectures on how the church isn't racist, and Gray was unwittingly being groomed for the job. During his time as a cub reporter for KSL, Gray was picked up by Wolsey, that's what we talked about earlier, and he was ponied around on the speaking circuit to reduce racist views against the Mormon church. Now, I couldn't find any of his speeches. I mean, that's probably due to lack of hard digging because I'm sure they exist. However, I was able to find a public speech he gave at the Affirmation Conference in 2014. That's right, Darius Gray is still alive, and he's still a prominent member and a black spokesman for the church. He's still doing this after so many years. Now, I'll play a small clip from it and leave a link to the entire 27-minute monologue in the show notes. It's really worth checking out. Now, because of time constraints, we're going to move quickly. What are the reasons that you heard or have yet heard why blacks could not hold the priesthood? Curse of Cain, thanks sinners. Less valiant. Less valiant. The whites not ready. The whites weren't ready. Love of snow What else? We had less valiant um, think sitters, a uh, curse of Cain, uh, one of um, uh, Noah's sons um, um, was cursed by his daddy, Ham. Okay. I can and have been given official right to tell you that none of those reasons is correct. <laughs> And brothers and sisters, we do have answers. 
uh, a young lady I met earlier today said, what do you do, what do you say when someone asks the question? And there are answers to be had, and I don't know if you're aware of them. So here's the first little uh, test here. How many are aware of a statement that the church put out last December 6th? Good. Now how many have read it? Oh, really good. For those who have not, I'm going to give you just a sampling of it. But it puts to bed, puts to rest, all of those false reasons that were created. And it is very much worth your time. Uh, I read it again this morning in its entirety. I'm very familiar with the process by which it came into existence. And some have wanted to discount it, saying, well, that's just something that public affairs put together. I am here to say that is not the case. The brethren, the senior brethren, the form of the club and the first presidency were involved with the creation of that document. All right, after that, he goes on to read from the Race and the Priesthood letter, which we will read soon, and he's able to justify his belief that God didn't command the priesthood ban, but rather allowed it. That's a direct quote from it. The crux of his argument stems from a paper that he wrote titled, Not a Curse, but a Calling, wherein he lays claims that the Mormon church was basically at the forefront of racial equality, and the ban was merely a test for black believers in the church. He claims that the Lord can make an opportunity out of horrible circumstances. He draws equivocation between Joseph being sold into Egyptian slavery and the priesthood ban, which is, uh, you know, just amazing. And he says, you know, that good can come from all of it, that God can turn these situations into good opportunities. But the thing is, he's very sincere. I mean, he's not just pandering. He's not just a politician or something up there. He's a very sincere, genuinely nice old black guy. He's just, I, I think he's misguided. Maybe he misses the point from the, you know, from the very opening statement of the lecture that we just listened to. I mean, up to the 1968 statement from the church that claimed they didn't know where the ban came from, every single church leader justified the priesthood ban with scripture and emphatically declared it as doctrine. But at the beginning of the speech, he said, no, those are all wrong. Now, I don't know if he's ignorant of these previous quotes or if he's just able to like set them aside and not consider the gravity of them. I, I just don't know. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he can square this circle and live with this cognitive dissonance, but I would strongly recommend watching his whole 27 minute lecture to see exactly how he does it. Now, he may be an elderly man and have a little hitch in his giddy up, but his mind is still quite flexible to twist itself into such knots to conform to his belief system. It is absolutely amazing. He reflects back to the 2013 race in the priesthood document that the church released, and I think that could be a source of the problem. And I did see at one point, I don't know if this is substantiated or not, um, I did see at one point that Darius Gray was actually a contributor to the, the race in the priesthood uh, article, but I only saw that in one place. I couldn't see it substantiated anywhere else. But I mean, like I said earlier, we'll read that race in the priesthood document in its entirety to finish out the episode. But for now, let's, let's kind of discuss how the church got from Darius Gray on the speaking circuit to actually lifting the ban on blacks having the priesthood, because we're missing some crucial pieces to the puzzle that really help explain a lot. So Let's recount for a second here. The church had problems, right? Sports teams were boycotting BYU until the ban was lifted. And, you know, you add into that the fact that the Sao Paulo Temple was in the middle of construction during these protests and boycotts, and the church was really starting to feel the burn of social pressures against their racism. The final pressure that was mounting in the mid-1970s that finally pushed the church over the edge was an existential threat to their pocketbook. <laughs> Imagine that, right? The church has functioned as a 501c3 tax-exempt religious institution since 501c3 status was adopted into the tax code in 1954. This basically makes all of their income non-taxable and saves the church billions of dollars in taxes per year. 
1976, two years before the LDS church lifted their racist ban on blacks having the priesthood, Bob Jones University was sued by the IRS for their own racism and had their tax-exempt status revoked retroactively to 1970 because they didn't even allow black people to join Bob Jones University, their own educational institution. This cost BJU millions of dollars in back taxes and served as a canary in the coal mine for the LDS church. If the Mormon church came onto the radar of the IRS for their own racial discrimination while these protests were happening against the BYU sports team, it could cost the church millions, possibly billions of dollars. And even worse, it would be a huge public relations nightmare while the church was in the white hot spotlight of the national news media. Once the church's funding was in jeopardy, they reacted pretty quickly. And finally, in 1978, the church released its revelation, lifting the ban on blacks having the priesthood. The statement that lifted the ban was quite short, and we'll read it here in a second, but first we have to understand how it came about before we read it. Now, while Gordon B. Hinckley, then a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, recounts this revelation as a wonderful and spiritual experience, the reality of it is much less remarkable. But this is how Gordon B. Hinckley remembered it. Quote, There was a hallowed and sanctified atmosphere in the room. For me, it felt as if a conduit opened between the heavenly throne and the kneeling, pleading prophet of God who was joined by his brethren. Every man in that circle, by the power of the Holy Ghost, knew the same thing. Not one of us who was present on that occasion was ever quite the same after that, nor has the church been quite the same." Now, I mean, this story is remarkable and beautiful and just marvelous, right? And this does sound like the way revelation from God should be given. You know, it's it's an awe-inspiring recounting of the events. I, it may have a little bit of a problem when we look for other sources. Let's find another quote from somebody that enlightens us to the actual situation a little better. A man named Wesley Walters interviewed then-Apostle LeGrand Richards as to how he remembers the situation happening and how the revelation came about in 1978. I started copying the text of the interview into the notes here, but then I found out that it was recorded on cassette. And with a quick Google search, I was able to find the actual audio exchange between Richards and Wesley. Now, the quality isn't great, and it's about four minutes long, so I'll clarify what happens after playing it. But I found the audio on thoughtsandthingsandstuff.com, and I'm not sure where they got it from, but I will leave a link to it in the show notes. Um, this interview is starting at minute 420 in the interview. From this uh, revelation of the priesthood to the Negro, I've heard all kinds of stories. I've heard that Christ appeared to the apostles. I've heard that Joseph Smith appeared. And then I heard another story that, that Spencer Kimball had had a concern about this for some time and simply shared it with the apostles and they decided that this was the right time to uh, move in that direction. Now, are any of those stories true or are they all? Well, the last one is pretty true. I, uh, I might tell you what provoked it in a way. All right. Now in Brazil, uh, there is so much Negro blood uh -huh. in the part of the population there that it's hard to get leaders uh -huh. I don't have Negro blood in them. I see. And we just built a temple down there. It's going to be dedicated in October. Oh, a lot of those people with Negro blood in them have been raising the money to build that temple. Yeah. And then if we don't change, mm -hmm. then they can't even use it. That's oh, yeah. Better. Right. So Father Kimball worried about it. He prayed a lot about it. And he asked each one of us of the 12, if we would pray, and we did, that the Lord had given him inspiration to know what the will of the Lord was. And then he invited each one of us in his office individually, because you know, mm -hmm. when you're in a group, you can't always express everything that's in your heart. So yeah. You're a part of the group, see? Right. So he interviewed each one of us personally to see how we felt about it. Uh -huh. He asked us to pray about it. And then he asked each one of us to hand in all of the references we had for or against that proposal, see? Mm -hmm. He was thinking favorably towards giving the current people the priesthood. 
Mm-hmm. And then we had a meeting in the, where we meet every week in the temple, and we discussed it as a group together. And then we, uh, we prayed about it in our prayer circle, and then we held another prayer circle after the close of that meeting. And he, he led in the prayer, praying that the Lord would give us the inspiration that we needed to do the thing that would be pleasing to him and for the blessing of his children. Mm-hmm. And then um, the next Thursday, we meet every Thursday, mm-hmm. uh, he, the presence came for this little document written out to make the announcement to see how we feel about it, so it's a genuine written form. Mm-hmm. Well, some of the members of the crowd suggested a few changes in the announcement, mm-hmm. and then in our meeting there, we all voted in favor of it, the crowd and the president. The one member of the crowd, Mark Peterson, was down in South America, mm-hmm. but Mother Benson, our president, had uh, the reins to go where he could be reached by four. And right while we were in our meeting in the temple, Mother uh, Kimball talked to Brother Benson and read him this article, talked to Brother Peterson and read him this article, and he approved of it. All right, I know that was kind of long and it was hard to hear it. It was kind of confusing. I and I tried to clarify the audio and, you know, clean it up as much as I could, but it was just a bad recording to begin with and it was from 1978. I mean, there wasn't much I could work with, but it was imp- important to hear it recounted from his own perspective and hear it from his own voice because we don't get to do that very often on this show. We don't get to have a you know, a, a huge monumental historical thing like this happened like in 1978 and I actually get to hear audio of the exchange. So whenever an opportunity like this comes up, I'm all over it. So that's why I played the audio and, you know, now I, I got to clarify it a little bit. So what happened was Wesley started off the interview with asking LeGrand Richards about the details surrounding, you know, the the revelation and how it came to be. And the first line in Richard's explanation began with talking about the temple that was being built in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that was to be dedicated two months after this interview. This interview was done in August, and the the Sao Paulo, Brazil temple was dedicated in October of that year. So yeah, maybe the timeline isn't necessarily coincidence. Anyway, but after talking about the temple and, you know, not having any attendance, Richard told Wesley that Spencer W. Kimball, you know, who was the president of the church, called each apostle in individually to counsel with about the soon-to-be revelation. Now, as you know, believing members usually understand that the quorum of the twelve apostles are, you know, they're this one unified voice led by the Spirit of God. But you know, honestly, if we look at it from what Legrand Richards was saying here, there must have been a lot of disagreements in the quorum. I mean, given the line that Richards said about you know something along the lines of when you're in a group, you can't always express your thoughts. So. After President Kimball talked with each apostle directly behind closed doors and individually, and while, of course, the most racist of the bunch, Marky Peterson, was out of town, the presidency brought the statement forward about allowing blacks to have the priesthood, and the whole quorum voted on it unanimously, except for Mark E. Peterson, who was in South America at the time. According to Richards, Kimball talked with Peterson on the phone about the revelation, and it was said that Peterson approved, but you know we don't have any details on it, so <laughs> who knows, right? If only we could have heard that phone conversation between President Kimball and ultimate racist Apostle Peterson, but you know, I can only dream about that. So after all was said and done, the statement was tidied up and sent to the press for publication. This is the entirety of the revelation as it first appeared in the Deseret News, June 9th, 1978. Quote, To all general and local priesthood officers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout the world, dear brethren, not sisters, dear brethren, As we have witnessed the expansion of the work of the Lord over the earth, we have been grateful that people of many nations have responded to the message of the restored gospel and have joined the church in ever-increasing numbers. This, in turn, has inspired us with a desire to extend to every worthy member of the church all the privileges and blessings which the gospel affords." 
aware of the promises made by the prophets and the presidents of the church who have preceded us that at some time in God's eternal plan, all of our brethren who are worthy may receive the priesthood. And witnessing the faithfulness of those from whom the priesthood has been withheld, we have pleaded long and earnestly in behalf of these, our faithful brethren, spending many hours in the upper room of the temple, supplicating the Lord for divine guidance. He has heard our prayers, and by revelation has confirmed that the long-promised day has come when every faithful, worthy man in the church may receive the holy priesthood with power to exercise its divine authority and enjoy with his loved ones every blessing that flows therefrom, including the blessings of the temple. Accordingly, all worthy male members of the church may be ordained to the priesthood without regard for race or color. Priesthood leaders are instructed to follow the policy of carefully interviewing all candidates for ordination to either Aaronic or the Melchizedek priesthood to ensure that they meet the established standards for worthiness. We declare with soberness that the Lord has now made known his will for the blessings of all his children throughout the earth, who will hearken to the voice of his authorized servants and prepare themselves to receive every blessing of the gospel. Sincerely yours, signed Spencer W. Kimball, N. Eldon Tanner, and Marion G. Romney, the First Presidency. End quote. <laughs> That's the revelation. And yes, that Marion G. Romney there, that is the third signatory on that, that is 2012 presidential hopeful Willard Mitt Romney's uncle. That's how close to today this history is. One of the people that was a runner-up for the President of the United States is the nephew of a member of the First Presidency when this revelation came along and blacks could finally get the priesthood. We're not talking five or six generations ago like this show usually deals with or, you know, would be expected with an abolishment of racist church doctrine. This revelation happened in many listener of this show's lifetime. My parents were about to go on their missions when the church finally relinquished the xenophobia and racism. I know there are at least some people listening to my voice right now that were members of the church when this monumental shift happened. That's one generation ago that the church finally stopped being systematically racist after 150 years of racism being a central point of their official doctrine, backed up and substantiated by canonized scriptures and statements from prophets and apostles. And just a side note on the revelation. I'm I'm currently reading through the Book of Commandments on you know with David Michael on my Book of Mormon podcast and you know those revelations often have their own feel. There's often you know grandiose language like "Thus saith the Lord" and "I am the Lord thy God" and and these color ID things and it's all in Elizabethan English and you know there's very very distinct um, things that we pick up on that are revelations from God, but. This was nothing like that. There was nothing like that in here. This just said we were questioning God and we were praying in the upper room of the temple, you know, supplicating the Lord for divine guidance. And then all that it said is he has heard our prayers and by revelation has confirmed that the long promised day has come that blacks can have the priesthood. There's nothing about thus saith the Lord and the, by holy decree we we say that the Lord brings this revelation forward in in the time of our man. There's there's nothing in there that was reminiscent of the the Book of Commandments or the Doctrine and Covenants or you know the Book of Mormon. It, nothing, none of this sounded anything like that. This is all uh, you know the only word in there that I recognize as being. Uh, you know, something that sounds like the Book of Mormon or the Book of Commandments or anything. It says, we declare with soberness that the Lord has now made known his will for the blessing of all his children. I mean, and even that, it doesn't say, behold, I am the Lord thy God, and I, I, and I make this declaration that my will and the blessing shall be covered or shall cover all the children of men. It didn't say that. I mean, right now, just on the fly, I'm coming up with a better sounding revelation than what they came up with. And they spent hours and days and, you know, weeks and months trying to come up with a perfect wording for this revelation. It's just, 
it's astounding how different it is. You know, when it's supposed to be given by this, this, you know, unchanging God, you know, it's a revelation given by the almighty unchanging God. So, you know, this revelation, quote unquote revelation, I don't know if you can consider that. It's just kind of more of a legal statement. Um, it was read out to all of the congregations as well as during the general conference. And, you know, unfortunately, as to be expected, some of the members of the church didn't share the same progressive ideals as their leadership. Now, I have to make a correction here because personally, I was under the impression that there was a person that opposed the vote in general conference, you know, and I... I, I think I've even asserted that on other episodes and maybe even on other podcasts that, you know, when they read this quote unquote revelation out in the general conference that a man stood up and said opposed and that they drug him out of the conference, I, I'm a complete, I was wrong. I'm just completely wrong on that. And, um, there's something up coming up later that I recorded before I found that out. Um, that, you know, I have a little treat for you guys here at, at near the end of the episode. Um, but there's, you know, I, I even assert it during that little treat and I wasn't aware of that until, until now. And I'm kind of ashamed because I never actually fact checked myself on that, but I actually went and watched the October, 1978 conference and watched where they read that revelation and everybody just raised their hands quietly. And, and, you know, they, they all sustained the vote to give blacks a priesthood, but you know, that's not to say that there wasn't a lot of opposition from other racist members of the church. I mean, they read it out not only in the general conference, but in local congregations. And a lot of those congregations experienced backlash from their members. And there was even a small exodus of believers that couldn't accept the new revelation. There were people that walked out of their churches when this revelation was given as a, you know, as their own opposition for, for the revelation, right? So, that yes i mean that's that's what the implications are yes there were people that were racist enough that they left the church when the church began giving blacks a priesthood now i couldn't find any hard numbers on this of course probably because they just simply don't exist but some online speculation asserts that as many as a few thousand members stopped attending church because of this shift in the racist doctrine so, you know, after all of this, after the whole PR nightmare that the church dealt with and, you know, members leaving because they were racist and didn't want blacks to have the priesthood, once the dust settled, black people began joining the church at unprecedented levels. Now, let me, let me clarify here. Those levels were only slightly higher than they were before the man was lifted, but they were still unprecedented. They, they had never seen an influx of uh, black members like they, they did after the, the ban was lifted. New missions were opened up in areas that were considered off limits before because they were all descendants of Cain. Missionaries were finally encouraged to proselyte to black people instead of discouraged. Um, there are plenty of stories where missionaries say whenever we went to a black person, you know, whenever we knocked on the door and a black person answered, we would just uh, share with them a message of Jesus and say, have a nice day. They wouldn't say, hey, can we come in and talk to you about the Book of Mormon? Because they were, you know, of they were, you know, dark and loathsome and obviously they didn't need to hear the priesthood, um, you know, and that was the justification for that is in the Book of Abraham. So, yeah, it's. It's offensive. I, I mean, it's just unbelievable, but, you know, well, I guess unbelievable is the wrong word for it. It's just straight up offensive that it was this racist and that the, the racism was this systematic. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's mind blowing, but, you know, we can fast forward one generation to 2013 and the church finally released an answer to the controversial racial questions in their essay titled Race and the Priesthood. Now, like I said earlier, we're going to read it in its entirety in just a second, but we can't ignore the sphere that this essay evolved out of. So with the advent of the internet, these huge issues are beginning to come to light. Without the internet, uh, finding the research necessary for just this episode probably would have taken months, possibly years, but I was able to access all this information from verifiable sources and compile it all in a two-week period. I mean, the Mormon religion is no longer able to hide behind the line claiming that they used to not give blacks a priesthood, but that was, you know, changed thanks to divine revelation. And now all the children of God can bask in the wonderful blessings the church has to offer. No, you can't hide behind that anymore. 
thanks to the internet and the vast amount of information on these topics, we're able to zoom out and view the doctrinal racism of the Mormon church for the entire 180 plus years of its existence. Thanks to the pressure that the internet has been putting on the Mormon church, they've been forced to own up to some of the uglier skeletons in their closet. I mean, too many people were asking too hard of questions, and the church could no longer ignore those hard questions or try to wave them away as anti-Mormon propaganda or something. The pressure from the internet spurred the church into releasing a series of essays about challenging things in Mormon history. We've even read their essays on polygamy in some of the early episodes of the show, and you know these essays are considered official church releases and constitute the official stance of the church on any given topic. This is the essay from LDS.org, the church's own official website, and we're going to read it in its entirety right now. It's relatively short, so you know, hang in there. It's really not all that bad to read, but it's absolutely packed with information that requires a lot of knowledge to understand the totality of. I'll be reading it and adding in my comments and analysis of it as we go. But today's episode has covered a lot of information that is necessary to know in order to understand this essay. And I'll be referring back to those snippets of information periodically. And I, I got to say this right at the onset, most of what I'll be um, deconstructing this essay with, I took from mormonthink.com. Um, they have an article on there that deconstructs the essay so well, and I'll be relying on it heavily while reading this, um, while I add my own analysis. So this is Race and the Priesthood, taken from LDS.org. <laughs> I'm... Uh, <clears throat> I just opened up the website, LDS.org, to start reading The Race and the Priesthood. On the right side, they have links to other articles, and um, two of those are, um, you know, black guys smiling at the camera, and, you know, it says, you know, read one church member's personal reflections on race and the priesthood, and he looks like a, an awful nice gentleman, but the other one is a picture of Darius Gray, and an article about him, and a video of him talking about race diversity, and Let's see, members speak about diversity, unity, and the priesthood. So, you know, Darius Gray is still very much a prominent part of the church's public relations um, regarding race and the priesthood. But anyway, let's, uh, <laughs> let's finally get to this thing and see what it's all about. Race and the Priesthood, read from LDS.org. In theology and practice, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints embraces the universal human family. Latter-day Saint scripture and teachings affirm that God loves all of his children and makes salvation available to all. God created the many diverse races and ethnicities and esteems them all equally. As the Book of Mormon puts it, all are alike unto God. All right, so the, the problem is, you know, it's it, it uses that those five words, all are alike unto God, and that is out of the Book of Mormon, which is really awesome, right? And, you know, I, I can't be bothered by them using that scripture reference to justify that, you know, all of us are equal. That's, that's awesome. But that is five words cherry picked out of one scripture out of the Book of Mormon. But there are more than 10 full scripture passages of which we read three or four of at the beginning of this episode that um, says explicitly that there are delineations between people that are, you know, actual members, or, you know, white and delights and members of the church, as opposed to, you know, uh, people that are um, like, what was that, that Brigham Young quote, the, the ones that are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their ha habits, wild and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of intelligence. I mean, <laughs> You know, it seems to ignore quite a bit of, you know, doctrine that is created in this church or that is part of this church's history. And not only Brigham Young has said, but, um, you know, like out of the Book of Mormon, it says, you know, that they are turned, um, their, their skin is like unto a flint, that they might not be enticing unto the people. Uh, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them, right? So, you know, they're cherry picking these five words out of, you know, out of the, the Book of Mormon, but they're ignoring many, many other passages that justify the races, you know, the, the ban on race and the priesthood. So, you know, I'm just saying that's, that's something worth pointing out here. 
The second paragraph goes on. The structure and organization of the church encourage racial integration. Latter-day Saints attend church services according to the geographical boundaries of their local ward or congregation. By definition, this means that the racial, economic, and demographic composition of Mormon congregations generally mirrors that of the wider local community. The church's lay ministry also tends to facilitate integration. A black bishop may preside over a mostly white congregation. A Hispanic woman may be paired with an Asian woman to visit the homes of a racially diverse membership. Church members of different races and ethnicities regularly minister in one another's homes and serve alongside one another as teachers, as youth leaders, and in myriad other assignments in their local congregations. Such practices make the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints a thoroughly integrated faith. So, you know, I, I kind of have to argue with that because, um, like I talked about earlier, we have, you know, over a hundred general authorities basically, and only two of those guys are actually black, you know, uh, from the outset look black. Um, you know, a small, small percentage of them are Latin American and, you know, a, a slightly larger percentage of them are Asian, uh, Filipino, um, Pacific Islanders and, um, you know, European, you know, German or what, what have you. I mean, even Uchtdorf has, uh, a, a German accent, right? So, you know, I talked about this earlier. It's like, you know, this might be true at the local levels, but it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't map to the, the actual church leadership. And those are the guys that, you know, set the policy for the church, right? You, like, I mean, earlier I said they had, you know, there might be a, uh, a black guy or that is a, you know, the, the stake president or a patriarch or a bishop in an area, but those are singularities. Those don't occur very often. And they're by far not representative of the congregation. Um, saying that they're, you know, where it says in here that, um, you know, a black bishop may preside over a mostly white congregation, you know, that's, that's just simply pulling out one example and saying that this happens occasionally it kind of speaks to the the truth that that's an anomaly that that is not the regular and that's obviously a problem um for the vast majority of leadership roles in the church they're white men that's it white men and there's no getting around that so uh, i'm going to continue on with lds.org here Despite this modern reality, for much of its history, from the mid-1800s until 1978, the church did not ordain men of black African descent to its priesthood or allow black men or women to participate in temple endowment or sealing ordinances. So I have a problem with that as well, because it's, you know, that's what it says. And that is the technicality of it. But I mean, like I said earlier in the show, this is, that was a checkpoint that black people couldn't pass, right? That was a bottleneck point that meant, you know, the implication of them not being able to have temple ordinances meant they couldn't get into heaven. And if they ever did get into heaven, they would only be sealed as, you know, eternal slaves to the white and delightsome people that, you know, made it in that had gone through their temple endowments and sealing ordinances. So, you know, I think that's missing the mark here. That's missing the point. Um, it's, it's talking about how these people weren't able to participate in temple ordinances, but it, that the implication of that is they weren't able to participate in heaven, which is, wrong it's just very very wrong it's very exclusionary um you know and and racist <laughs> i know i've said that a couple of times but it's just racist um the fourth paragraph goes on the church was established in 1830 during an era of great racial division in the united states at the time many people of african descent lived in slavery and racial distinctions and prejudice were not just common but customary among white americans those realities, though unfamiliar and disturbing today, influenced all aspects of people's lives, including their religion. Many Christian churches of that era, for instance, were segregated along racial lines. From the beginnings of the church, people of every race and ethnicity could be baptized and received as members. Towards the end of his life, church founder Joseph Smith openly opposed slavery. There has never been a churchwide policy of segregated congregations. All right, so there's a lot to deconstruct in there. First, it says, you know, those realities, though unfamiliar and disturbing today, influence all aspects of people's lives, including their religion. So that is right at the onset saying that those those beliefs and those um, 
racial distinctions and prejudices that people had, um, one might call it bigotry, influenced the Mormon church and its doctrine. If this is the one true doctrine, if this is the one true church of God, that shouldn't be a thing. Humans should have, you know, no bearing on what God believes and what God translates to his most holy prophets. And then it goes on to say, you know, many Christian churches were segregated along racial lines. That's true. Um, uh, from the beginning of the church, people of every race and ethnicity could be baptized and received as members. Yes, but that's ignoring what it said, you know, earlier with that they couldn't have the priesthood and they couldn't go into the temple, which denies them heaven, basically. It doesn't denies them exaltation. Only white and delightsome folk can go up and get their own planet. And then the, the last one that I took most issue with, it says, toward the end of his life, church founder Joseph Smith openly opposed slavery. And I, that's, I, I'm sorry, that's just wrong. And I, I don't want to read that quote right now, but we'll get into that quote and kind of, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that at the end of the show. But Joseph Smith never opposed slavery. Simple as that. He never opposed slavery. And that is um, either whoever wrote this that was either ignorant or that is uh, obfuscating the truth. And it is a lie. I'm sorry. That's they just straight up lied. So the next paragraph says, during the first two decades of the church's existence, a few black men were ordained to the priesthood. One of these men, Elijah Abel, we talked about him, also participated in temple ceremonies in Kirtland, Ohio, and was later baptized as proxy for deceased relatives in Nauvoo, Illinois. There is no reliable evidence that any black men were denied the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime. In a private church council three years after Joseph Smith's death, Brigham Young praised Q. Walter Lewis, a black man, who had been ordained to the priesthood, saying, We have one of the best elders, an African. So I'm going to read the the deconstruction of that straight from the Mormon Think article because it... it it says it much better than I do. Um, it says, um, you know, it talking about Elijah Abel here. It says, this is carefully crafted language, which gives the impression that Brother Abel had full temple privileges in Kirtland Temple. However, the Kirtland Temple was not a temple as we think of one today. For example, it was open to the public like a stake center or other chapel is today. In fact, in Kirtland, there were no temple ceremonies other than an early version of the washing and anointing ordinance which Elijah did participate in. Well, that's because Joseph at this time, you know, in 1836, 37, that this is talking about, Joseph hadn't uh, risen to a a third level uh, Freemason at this point. So the uh, temple ceremonies as we know them today just weren't a thing. They hadn't been invented basically. So um, that's that. Yeah. So that's the only temple ordinance that Elijah Abel was part of was the washing and anointing ordinance, which was just, um, you know, I think it was just a washing of the feet basically. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, like it says, it's very carefully crafted language that isn't lying, but it's still not the complete truth, which I I'm bothered by. Um, it goes on here, um, but there was no endowment ceremony or sealing ceremony. They didn't even do baptisms for the dead in the temple. That wouldn't begin until Nauvoo. Mentioning that Elijah performed baptisms for the dead in Nauvoo very likely refers to his doing so in a river, as all early baptisms for the dead were done, not in the Nauvoo temple. So, I mean, it just says it really, really well here. Um, let's see. I'm just going to keep reading from the Mormon Think article because it, it it keeps on deconstructing this paragraph really well. And this is a packed paragraph. There's a lot to talk about. It says, if only two or perhaps three black men received the priesthood in the early days of the church, then it seems more likely that these were either favors or mistakes. Undoubtedly, there were more than two or three black men in the first 20 years of the church who wanted the full privilege of the restored gospel by receiving the priesthood and being sealed to their families. It is of interest to note that Elijah Abel was only one eighth black and had a rather plain appearance. And you, there's actually a photo of him. You can see um, if you just type in Elijah Abel to the Wikipedia article, you can see a photo of him. Um, some speculate that it wasn't readily apparent that he was black. Um, so that's just absolutely amazing that he, you know, he didn't even appear black on the surface and therefore uh, he was able to get a pass. Uh, he was able to get the priesthood, but, um, 
And then uh, the the next line that it goes to de- on to deconstruct it says there is no evidence that any black men were denied the priesthood during Joseph Smith's lifetime, and the the article says this seems to imply that Joseph didn't believe in the ban. However, that is contradicted by the December fifteenth, nineteen sixty nine first presidency statement on race issued to general authorities, regional representatives, so on and so forth. And it said from the beginning of this dispensation, Joseph Smith and all succeeding prophets of the church have taught that Negroes, while spirit children of a common father, are the progeny of our earthly parents, Adam and Eve, were not yet to receive the priesthood for reasons which we believe are known to God, but which he has not made fully known to man. So the race and the priesthood article saying that there's no evidence that any black men were denied the priesthood, that flies in the face of the December 15th, 1969 statement of the church justifying the ban and saying that we don't know where it came from. We read that quote directly earlier. Um, so obviously, um, and, and you know, just if you look at the numbers, I mean, it seems absurd that only two or three black men received the, the priesthood in the first 20 years of the church under Joseph Smith. Um, but you know, there were obviously a lot more than just two or three black men that were members of the church. So, uh, I would say that there probably is evidence that, you know, black men were denied the priesthood in this case. And, you know, it's just because, just because we don't know their names and we haven't heard their stories doesn't mean that they were openly embraced in as church members and given the priesthood. Um, that's just an argument from, from lack of, of, uh, information an argument from ignorance, basically. So, um, so let me move on to the next paragraph here. It says in 1852, president Brigham Young publicly announced that men of black African descent could no longer be ordained to the priesthood though. Thereafter blacks continued to join the church through baptism and receiving the gift of the Holy ghost. I love how it doesn't actually give us Brigham Young's quote there, probably because it sounds too racist. Um, yeah, they include little quotes from Joseph Smith or from, you know, other church officials here or Brigham Young praising this, this black man saying we have one of the best elders an African, but you know, the quote where Brigham Young says that we, um, you know, if no other prophet has said it before me, I say it now in the name of Jesus Christ, Negroes cannot have the priesthood. Um, you know, it seems to omit that quote for some reason. I, I just wonder why. Um, the, the article continues following the death of Brigham Young, subsequent church presidents restricted blacks from receiving the temple endowment or being married in the temple. Over time, church leaders and members advanced many theories to explain the priesthood and temple restrictions. None of these explanations is accepted today as the official doctrine of the church. <laughs> that was some cleverly worded stuff here. So, um, uh, we're going to the Mormon think article. It says if the prophet after Joseph Smith were responsible for the ban on blacks from receiving the priesthood. And if indeed this was a false doctrine, then how could any of those men possibly be prophets for men to deny an entire race, the benefit of the priesthood for 150 years is inexcusable. And, you know, just on my own thoughts, um, <laughs> How could that possibly be from God, right? I mean, if if these men were making mistakes, if these were incorrect doctrines, or Orson Hyde said explicitly, or sorry, Wilford Woodruff said explicitly that any man that's a prophet of the church that leads the church astray, he will be removed from his office. And that is official church doctrine from the official declaration one. So in asserting that these men led the church away or whatever completely contradicts what we expect a a prophet to do, right? It's completely inaccurate and it completely ignores what a prophet is supposed to do in leading the members of the church and what, uh, you know, what these racist men asserted as doctrine that were just thoughts in their own head. Um, so the, the Mormon think article continues here. If Brigham Young instituted the priesthood ban on blacks without being directed to from God, then this is just too serious to ignore. Yes. Yes. Very well said. And you know, denying an entire race, the benefit of the priesthood for 150 years is inexcusable. You know, Mormon thinks just says it so well here. And if all the prophets since Brigham Young until Spencer W. Kimball let it go unchallenged, then how can anyone say these men are truly prophets of God? It's ironic that all the other Christian churches that do not claim to have prophets allowed blacks the same rights as whites long before the prophet-led LDS church did. If the LDS prophets made this big of an error, then why should they be believed on other matters? Which just draws a huge circle around all of this, right? 
if these prophets were, you know, supposedly leading the church, then the church, you know, the LDS church was one of the last churches to embrace um, her, to embrace blacks and to, you know, remove racist doctrines from their church then why do we consider this to be a church that's led by the prophet? And if we can't trust these prophets and these church leaders about, you know, blacks having the priesthood, what else have they made mistakes on? What else can't we trust them on? So Mormon think you just did an amazing job of talking about that. Um, yeah, the, the next point that it talks about is uh, where the, the article said, over time, church leaders and members advanced many theories to explain the priesthood and temple restrictions. None of these explanations is accepted today as the official doctrine of the church. Okay, so uh, that's a huge problem because um, you guys heard how many times I said doctrine when I was reading through those quotes. We were reading from Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, and we were reading Doctrine from Joseph Fielding Smith. We were reading these these things that you know the leaders were saying that it is not just a policy, but it is doctrine of the church. So um, there's no there's no getting around that word. Other prophets and leaders had used that word doctrine before, and now the church says that, oh, well, none of these explanations are, you know, these, um, you know, many members try to advance theories to explain it, but none of these explanations is official doctrine of the church. No, 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 no. That is absolutely wrong. They, those leaders emphatically said, this is not policy. This is doctrine and there's no getting out from under that heavy word that's a very meaningful word and it holds a lot of weight to it and they the, the church just can't squirrel out from under this it even goes on to uh you know the mormon think article even goes on to uh discuss this um you know very emphatically here i mean we read plenty of quotes from this but it goes on to re uh, quote something from the comprehensive history of the church volume 2 chapter 47 page 128 and it says the book of abraham is rich both in doctrine and in historical incidents there's that word of the latter the fact of the large influence of egyptian religious ideas in chaldea in the days of abraham is established the descent of the black race from cain then it inserted the word negro in there the first murderer the preservation of that race through the flood by the wife of ham egyptus which in the chaldean signifies egypt which signifies that which is forbidden the descendants of egyptus were cursed as pertaining to the priesthood that is they were barred from holding that divine power the origin also of egypt Egyptians. These things, together with an account of Abraham migrating from Chaldea to Egypt, constitute the chief historical items that are contained in the book. So uh, there's there's that word doctrine and in historical incidents. I mean, it says the book of Abraham clearly asserts that it was doctrine that Egyptus and anybody that's descended from the you know from Cain that is part of the black race cannot have the priesthood. They were cursed as pertaining to the priesthood. There's no getting out from under that. Now, while it does say um, none of these explanations is accepted today as official doctrine of the church, that is a little way to try and squirrel out from under this. But you can't ignore the fact that for the past 150 years, it was accepted as doctrine and emphatically stated as doctrine of the church. So there's just no way of squaring this circle. There's no way of saying, okay, everything in our history, it doesn't matter anymore. Only thing that matters is what we declare history today as, or what we declare our doctrine today as. That's just blatantly ignoring the scripture of the church that's included in the Pearl of Great Price, ignoring the Book of Mormon tenets about it, about racism and about uh, you know skin color being correlated to righteousness, and that's ignoring what every single church leader before 1978 understood and asserted was church doctrine. <laughs> I can't be emphatic enough about this. They can't just ignore it all. They can't just run away from it. That we we caught them red handed. They can't run away. Um, so the uh, the the LDS dot org race in the priesthood article continues here uh, with the the next portion of it is uh, a headline: the church in an American racial culture. And this is going to be important. So uh, 
Uh, this, uh, I can't wait. Um, it goes on to uh, to say, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was restored amidst a highly contentious racial culture in which whites were afforded great privilege. Yeah, that's true. In 1790, the U.S. Congress limited citizenship to free white persons. Over the next half century, issues of race divided the country while slave labor was legal in the more agrarian South. It was eventually banned in the more urbanized North. Even so, racial discrimination was widespread in the North as well as in the South, and many states implemented laws banning interracial marriage. In 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that blacks possessed no rights which the white man was bound to respect. A generation after the Civil War, 1861-1865, led to the end of slavery in the United States. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal facilities for blacks and whites were constitutional, a decision that legalized a host of public color barriers until the court reversed itself in 1954. Not until 1967 did the court strike down laws forbidding interracial marriage. Yeah, and, um, you know... All that we've been talking about this whole time is that the church is a product of the time that it was a part of. It's not the product of a mind of, you know, the almighty God. Um, it's just absurd that they are, well, not absurd. I guess it's, I guess it's good that that paragraph there describing the racial tensions that were going on in America and saying, hey, we were just doing what everybody else was doing, but that's exactly the point. If the church is doing and the leaders of the church are doing exactly what all the other people on the, in the, in the United States are doing, you can't really discern between divinely inspired men versus just racist white men. So, um, yeah, I, there's, Good paragraph. I agree with almost everything in that paragraph. It's quite amazing. Uh, it goes on. In 1850, the U.S. Congress created Utah Territory, and the U.S. President appointed Brigham Young to the position of territorial governor. Southerners who had converted to the church and migrated to Utah with their slaves raised the question of slavery's legal status in the territory. In two speeches delivered before the Utah Territorial Legislation in January and February of 1852, Brigham Young announced the policy restricting men of black African descent from priesthood ordination. At the same time, President Young said that at some future day, black church members would have all the privileges and more enjoyed by other members. Okay, that was one quote from Brigham Young that said that. Oh, there are a bunch of other quotes from Brigham Young that say, you know, if a man mixes his, you know, if a righteous man mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, then the penalty is death on the spot. This will always be so. He said that many times in his quotes that this, that these things will never change. On the Mormon Think article, they leave a link to Brigham Young's speech in February of 1852 that was quoted, um, but it goes on to say uh, on mormonthink.com, they neglect to include the many racist quotes as well as quotes that indicate that there is no promise that the restrictions would be lifted in the foreseeable future. Brigham Young said, and they emphasize parts of it, he said, uh, the Lord told Cain that he should not receive the blessings of the priesthood nor his seed until the last of the posterity of Abel had received the priesthood until until the redemption of the earth. And then it goes on to say, I know they are. I know that they cannot bear rule in the priesthood for the curse on them was to remain upon them until the residue of the posterity of Michael and his wife received the blessings. The seed of Cain would have received had they not been cursed and hold the keys of priesthood until the times of restitution shall come and the curse be wiped off from the earth and from Michael's seed. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it really... The, if you look at just that one Brigham Young statement that the the you know LDS.org article talked about or the essay talked about, yes, that does sound like, oh, that's great. You know, Brigham Young thought that eventually the, the ban would be lifted, but that's ignoring a vast majority of his other quotes where he said that this will always be the case, that the ban will always be there. Um, all right, so the next paragraph in the, the LDS.org article uh, the justifications for this restriction echoed the widespread ideas about racial inferiority that had been used to argue for the legalization of black servitude in the Utah Territory. It's slavery, not servitude. Thank you very much. According to one view, which had been promulgated in the United States from at least the 1730s, blacks descended from the same lineage as the biblical Cain who slew his brother Abel. 
Those who accepted this view believed that God's curse on Cain was the mark of a dark skin. Black servitude was sometimes viewed as a second curse placed upon Noah's grandson Canaan as a result of Ham's indiscretion towards his father. Although slavery was not a significant factor in Utah's economy and was soon abolished, the restriction on priesthood ordinations remained. Okay, so... um. Going to the Mormon Think article, it said uh, the footnotes to the external sources cited as the origin of these views. But why did the church not include the many Mormon scriptures that support these same views? There are at least 10 separate sets of passages in scriptures unique to the LDS faith that discuss the black skin as a curse and several that link the curse to Cain. And then it gives a whole bunch of examples of, uh, you know, some of the the things that we read at the beginning of the show, like um, Second Nephi, um, Third Nephi uh, uh, two fifteen, it says Alma three six. Um, there's a bunch more in the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. You know, those are passages that are unique to only Mormon scripture, and the you know the the LDS dot org article completely ignores those, and that's that's wrong. That is uh, obfuscating the the source of this idea um and even more than that it's saying you know even from as early as the 1730s people believed that blacks descended from the same lineage as the biblical cain who slew his brother abel and that's where the mark of the dark skin comes from okay great i understand that but then you're saying that mormonism evolved out of the time and place that it came from i i understand From a naturalistic perspective, that makes perfect sense. But if this religion is indeed from God and um, the Book of Mormon is written from plates that were supposedly, you know, buried 1400 years or 1600 years ago in the ground and, um, you know, the Book of Abraham was translated from ancient Egyptian papyri um, that written by the hand of Abraham himself, yeah. You wouldn't think that doctrines that these Christian sects believe in from, you know, as early as the 1730s would make their way into the scriptures of the Book of Mormon. So that's very carefully worded and it completely ignores the LDS, strictly LDS scriptures that justify all of this. So that's an obfuscation of the truth as well. So, you know, so far um, out of these, you know, nine paragraphs that we've read, I think we're swinging one for nine on all these that I fully agree with. And that was just talking about the racism inherent in American history. Um, Everything else, every other paragraph, there has been some sort of problem. There's been something I've had to take issue with because it's a slight misrepresentation of the facts. And it's, it's this, it's this twisted Mormon ease that they're able to twist it into. Let's see. We only have a few paragraphs left here on the LDS.org article. Um, It says, even after 1852, at least two black Mormons continued to hold the priesthood. When one of these men, Elijah Abel, petitioned to receive his temple endowment in 1879, his request was denied. Oh, imagine that. Jane Manning, James, um, we talked about Jane Manning, a faithful black member who crossed the plains and lived in Salt Lake City until her death in 1908, similarly asked to enter the temple. She was allowed to perform baptisms for the dead for her ancestors, but was not allowed to participate in other ordinances. They seem to ignore the fact that she was sealed as Joseph and Emma's slave for eternity because she had black skin as opposed to being adopted um just completely ignoring it and it goes on the curse of cain was often put forward as justification for the priesthood and temple restrictions around the turn of the century another explanation gained currency blacks were said to have been less than fully valiant in the pre-mortal battle against lucifer and as a consequence were restricted from priesthood and temple blessings uh, yep, there it is talking about that pre-mortal existence. Um, at least they're embracing it. Um, but it doesn't go on to say that that originally came from Orson Hyde in 1847, sorry, 1845, a year after Joseph Smith died. So, you know, trying to assert that around the turn of the century, that's when the, the, the uh, this alternate explanation of the pre-mortal existence and, you know, blacks being fence sitters, that's when it gained, you know, relevance. That's wrong. That's simply ignoring facts. I don't know if they're ignorant to the facts or if they're just blatantly lying about it, but I take a huge issue with that paragraph as well. And see, this is why I'm reading this article at the end of this episode, because there's so much 
that we have to know about and so much history that we have to understand in order to really understand what the LDS.org article is talking about because there are significant problems with this and obfuscations of the truth and blatant lies that we pointed out and we're, we're about halfway through it right now. So <laughs> it, it requires a vast swath of knowledge and a bit of research in order to understand exactly what they're talking about and then be able to refute some of these claims that they're making. So uh, the next paragraph on the race and the priesthood goes by the late 1940s and fifties, racial integration was becoming more common in American life. Church president David O. McKay emphasized that the restriction extended only to men of black African descent. The church had always allowed Pacific Islanders to hold the priesthood, and President McKay clarified that black Fijians and Australian Aborigines could also be ordained to the priesthood and instituted missionary work among them. In South Africa, President McKay reversed a prior policy that required prospective priesthood holders to trace their lineage out of Africa. So that's where I was talking about earlier. This is when the line was softening. And uh, this is when David O. McKay was softening the hard line about race and the priesthood. And he, and he said, you know, OK, so all of these people that are black, they're not actually black. And oh, yeah, I, all you South Africans, you're not actually African. So, you know, it's just Central African. It's just a really, really dark black people. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can agree with this. I can agree that this is what happened, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't say that this was a point where they they were making, you know, small movements where the church was, you know, taking very very small steps backwards and trying to, uh, you know, trying to embrace this and not be so hard line against it. Um, that that's a sentiment that's lost in this. It goes on. Nevertheless, given the long history of withholding the priesthood from men of black African descent, church leaders believed that a revelation from God was needed to alter the policy, and they made ongoing efforts to understand what should be done. After praying for guidance, President McKay did not feel impressed to lift the ban. Imagine that. It took Kimball coming along. As the church grew worldwide, its overarching mission to go ye therefore and teach all nations seemed increasingly incompatible with the priesthood and temple restrictions. The Book of Mormon declared that the gospel message of salvation should go forth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. While there were no limits on whom the Lord invited to partake of his goodness through baptism. The priesthood and temple restrictions created significant barriers, a point made increasingly evident as the church spread in international locations with diverse and mixed racial heritages. So that's where it's obfuscating the truth a little bit more, because like I said earlier, um, missionaries were taught from the book of Abraham that God wouldn't allow Enoch to go preach to the, um, the children of Cain. And he explicitly said that they, uh, because they're undesirable and they need to be uh, marked apart so that they're unattractive, basically, right? So, and the, the church embraces, and that's a problem because when missionaries would go to a, a church, or you know, sorry, when missionaries would go tracting and they would go knocking on doors and they would knock and a black person would answer the door, they were instructed to share a message about Jesus and say, have a nice day. They were instructed explicitly to not proselyte to black people. So that's an obfuscation of the truth again. And it said, um, you know, here there were no limits on who the Lord invited to partake of his goodness through baptism. Um, a point made increasingly evident as a church spread in international locations with diverse and mixed racial heritages. So as the, you know, the church's missionary force was getting bigger and bigger and going into these more black communities, they're having a harder time saying, Oh, you know, we're only going to talk to you if you're white enough, if you're black or even look a little bit black, we can't share our gospel with you. So that was obviously a big pressure that was happening on the church. And that is a sentiment that's lost in this LDS.org article, a truth that is obfuscated. Once again, I, I mean, this is what this article is. It's just slight twisting of the truth in so many ways. It goes on, Brazil in particular presented many challenges. All right, we're going to hear about the, the temple now. Unlike the United States and South Africa, where legal and de facto racism led to deeply segregated societies, Brazil prided itself on its open, integrated, and mixed racial heritage. In 1975, the church announced that a temple would be built in Sao Paulo, Brazil. As the temple construction proceeded, church authorities encountered faithful black and mixed ancestry Mormons who had contributed financially and in other ways to the building of the temple, a sanctuary they realized they would not be allowed to enter once it was completed. 
There are sacrifices as well as the conversions of thousands of Nigerians and Ghanaians in the 1960s and early 70s moved church leaders. Well, okay, so this is not necessarily an obfuscation of the church, but this is ignoring something that was, you know, kind of, uh, you know, a a part of it, a, a piece of it. It kind of, it, it gives us a little two cents here. It does say that they would, you know, they would not be allowed to enter once the temple was completed and they had contributed financially and in other ways to building the temple and they wouldn't be allowed in. And that was a problem. I get that. But also, it ignores the fact that the temple was announced in 1975, and that's when, you know, things started happening really against the church uh, with the, the racism and with uh, what they were trying to do to be more normalized and less racist sounding. It doesn't tell us that, you know, four months before that church actually went active and was dedicated, that the the lift of the priesthood ban was given. So it doesn't talk about how coincidentally close those timelines really were. It just says in 75, you know, three years before the revelation came about, you know, that's when the Sao Paulo Brazil was talked, Brazil temple was talked about, but it's still ignoring how close those timelines matched up. And I think that there's, there's a connection there that we can't necessarily ignore. So it's not necessarily an obfuscation of the truth. It's just omitting some of the facts, omitting some of the, the finer details of it, which I have a problem with as well. Um, the article continues, church leaders pondered promises made by prophets such as Brigham Young that black members would one day receive priesthood and temple blessings. In June 1978, after spending many hours in the upper room of the Salt Lake Temple supplicating the Lord for divine guidance, church president Spencer W. Kimball, his counselors in the first presidency, and members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles received a revelation. He has heard our prayers, and by revelation has confirmed that the long-promised day has come. Of course, it's reading that straight from the, the revelation. The first presidency stated that they were aware of the promises made by the prophets and presidents of the church who have preceded us, that all of our brethren who are worthy may receive the priesthood. The revelation rescinded the restriction on priesthood ordination. It also extended the blessings of the temple to all worthy Latter-day Saints, men and women. The first presidency statement regarding the revelation was canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants as official declaration number two. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. I, I don't have a whole lot to add in on that that I haven't already said when we read that. Um, so let's just continue on to the next paragraph here. The revelation on the priesthood, as it is commonly known in the church, was a landmark revelation and a historic event. I don't know how many times I've heard to it referred to as the revelation on the priesthood. I've always just heard it as blacks in the priesthood or the ban on the priesthood. Um, you know, revelation on the priesthood sounds a little more floofy and kind than it actually was. But anyway, um, those who were present at the time described it in reverent terms. Gordon B. Hinckley, we read Gordon B. Hinckley's um, statement on it already, remembered it this way. And it says, you know, it, it recounts the whole thing. There was a hallowed and sanctified atmosphere in the room, and then it ends with, nor has the church quite been the same. We already read that. I'm not going to read it again. And I reacted to it already. Um, I think Legrand Richard's um, recounting of this, the actual situation is a lot more inclusive and makes a lot more sense and has a very naturalistic understanding and has, you know, it doesn't require a revelation from a God on high. It's just a PR move. It was just a business meeting that they said, okay, we're getting screwed on this. Uh, we gotta, we gotta do something to change. But, uh, anyway, that's, that's just, I, I already sussed that out. I already kind of discussed that anyway. So I'm going to move on. Reaction worldwide was overwhelmingly positive among church members of all races. <laughs> um, okay, uh, if you say so, overwhelmingly positive. I, there were still a lot of diehard racists that were really pissed off about the church. Um, I'm going to recall... Um, um, a quote that I heard cash from atheists on air say, and, um, you know, he was a member of the church and his dad and parents were members of the church at the time that, that the revelation came out and, you know, cash is just the greatest guy ever. You know, I've, I've, I don't know if I've ever met a podcaster with more heart than good old cash. Um, I just love the guy. He's an amazing guy, but I remember him telling me, about, you know, sitting in the living room with his, his dad and mom when they were watching that, that conference where they or you know, maybe it was a news report or whatever of the, the revelation giving the blacks priesthood. And, um, if I remember this correctly, this is from my memory. Um, but cash said, you know, his dad at the time said, 
uh, oh, so they're just going to give the niggers a priesthood and that's it. And that was like this, you know, amazing thing that Cash didn't realize that it was, it had so much implication, but you know, Cash's dad couldn't have been the only guy that took pro, you know, had an issue with that. He couldn't have been the only racist Mormon that was pissed off about blacks getting their priesthood. Right. So, you know, when it says reaction worldwide was overwhelmingly positive among church members of all races, maybe, maybe it was, but there was still a small subsect of people that were really pissed off and stopped going to church because they, the church gave blacks the priesthood. So I think that's kind of a, that's ignoring the facts a little bit, not telling us the whole truth. It's a slight obfuscation once again. It goes on to say, many Latter-day Saints wept for joy at the news. <laughs> Some reported feeling a collective weight lifted from their shoulders. Oh, isn't it wonderful? The church began priesthood ordinations for men of African descent immediately, and black men and women entered temples throughout the world. Soon after the revelation, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, an apostle, spoke of new light and knowledge that had erased previous limited understanding. <laughs> I, there's nothing to say more. That's... that. It's amazing that it's ignoring a lot of what was going on and a lot of the the backlash that the the church had to deal with from racist individuals. Um, it just presents it as this wonderful, you know, fairy tale land of oh, it, it just came about in this time when you know something was were going on, but then when we finally did it, everybody was so happy. And no, it's just it's not all it's not 100% right is the problem is you know when you tell a 98% truth a lot of deception and lies can hide in that 2% of truth that you omit so i i'm just i really don't like this article it's giving me an uneasy feeling about all of this um but the next 3 paragraphs are going to take us to the end and i think it's just so amazing and they say the art, the heading of it says the church today and it starts off, today the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life, that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form. That paragraph was a work of art. <laughs> wow. The church today, it's worded so beautifully, just it just so it can't, it's not quite wrong. The church today disavows the theories advanced in the past. Okay, first of all, they were not theories, they were doctrine. They were doctrine passed down by presidents, prophets, and leaders of the church. They were not theories. It was doctrine. You can't get out from under that word. Then it says in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse. So you are ignoring passages out of the Book of Mormon and out of the Pearl of Great Price. So we can throw both of those books out at the time. And then it says, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in the pre-mortal life. So you're ignoring basically what all of the general authorities and all of the prophets have said up to this point, or, you know, up to 1978, where they said, oh, well, it was because these men were fence sitters, basically. And, you know, we talked about that, but okay. So that's ignoring a lot of things that, you know, that's ignoring a lot of quotes and a lot of church doctrine and a lot of things that are included in the church's own journal of discourses that it itself, that the church itself produced and uh, publishes. Uh, <laughs> it's ignoring so much. And then it says um, that mixed race marriages are a sin. So that's ignoring Brigham Young, where he said the penalty is death on the spot. If a man mixes his seed with the seed of Cain, um, and this will always be so there's, that was so emphatic. So let's see. And then it goes on to say, you know, uh, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. So in that one paragraph, they threw out, um, early church doctrine, um, of what prophets and apostles have advanced for so long. It threw out book of Mormon. It threw out the book of Abraham it threw out Brigham Young many, many times in that. 
Um, so what do we have left? Well, out of all of that, it threw all of those things out the window. Um, and it says, you know, that, that any other race or ethnicity is an inferior in any way to anyone else that just threw out a whole bunch of quotes that we read it threw out what a lot of leaders have said up to 1978 or up to 1969. Um, it just threw all those out the window. So none of it matters anymore, right? None of it matters. The church in that one paragraph has divorced itself so much from its own history that it's completely unrecognizable. The next paragraph says, since that day in 1978, the church has looked to the future, of course, because your past is too dark to look behind you. You have to look to the future. As membership among Africans, African Americans, and other of African descent has continued to grow rapidly. While church records for individual members do not indicate an individual's race or ethnicity, the number of church members of African descent is now in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, and probably only a few thousand of them are actually still active. So that's an obfuscation of the truth too. The church proclaims, this is the final paragraph, there better be some redeeming clause in this paragraph because this seems absurd to be the answer to the problems that we've raised in the two and a half hours before we started reading this article. So there better be something really good in this final paragraph. We're going to find out. The church proclaims that redemption through Jesus Christ is available to the entire human family on the conditions God has prescribed. So joining the Mormon church and having a temple recommend and doing your temple ordinances and being endowed and getting your, you know, taking out your endowments and, you know, doing the signs and tokens of the church. And so all of those things are necessary that, you know, those are the things that are prescribed. So, you know, oh, and not being black until 1978, that was a big part of it too. So, you know, I, I I, that's not wrong. It's not wrong. And it says redemption through Jesus Christ is available. So that's all right. It affirms that God is no respecter of persons and emphatically declares that anyone who is righteous, regardless of race is favored of him. Mm, I don't, mm, I don't necessarily agree with that because I left the church and I, um, I consider myself, um, righteous. I consider myself, well, not righteous. I guess that's the wrong word. Um, I consider myself to be a good humanistic person. I'm very concerned with, uh, the well being of other people. So I feel like I'm, you know, in that sense, a righteous person, but, um, I knew the church and now I deny the church. So therefore I am going to hell. So God is, um, in that sense, definitely a respecter of persons. He respects what people have done and what, you know, where people came from, uh, and their belief system. And God will, you know, burn people in hell fire for eternity, just if they don't believe in him. So in that case, God is definitely a respecter of persons, whatever that exactly means. Um, I know that that phrase, no respecter of persons is often said, you know, everybody looks alike to Jesus. You know, everybody is the same, you know, he doesn't, you know, God doesn't delineate between, um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're, um, you know, Jew or if you're Gentile or if you're whatever Islam, you know, Muslim or Hindu or whatever, God doesn't respect that. He is, you know, we are all part of the human family, which is, you know, Pretty vastly different from uh, what Marky Peterson has said. Um, very different from what he said. Um, very different than what a lot of the church members have said or church leaders have said up to the point that the 1978 revelation came out. So, you know, that's a huge obfuscation of the truth as well. And it's taking that, you know, no respecter of persons, that four words out of, uh, I guess, out of the Book of Mormon. And it's just cherry picking them. And it's it's wrong. It's It's just wrong. Um, because obviously God, um, uh, respects or is a respecter of persons in the fact that he, um, puts a line of demarcation between those who are righteous, those who are not, those who are black, those who are white, uh, those who are male, those who are female. Um, those are important things to talk about as well. So, you know, those are kind of, yeah, I, I don't agree with all of that. That's all just, you know, that's very wrong. God is a respecter of persons in the context that it's saying here. Um, let's see the, the final line here says the teaching of the church in relation to God's children are epitomized by a verse in the second book of Nephi. And it quotes that verse, the Lord denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile end quote. And that is the end of the race and the priesthood article from LDS.org. And it was, um, I, I don't know what else to say. It's just wrong. It is just 
wrong. The church just, you know, just on that final line there, t- cherry picking that thing out of the second book of Nephi, that one line, it just cherry picks that out and ignores the 10 other unique LDS scripture passages that say God does delineate between black and white, between male and female, between bond and free. If you are a black slave female in the church, you're screwed. That's it. End of story. Um, that's what the other 10 passages in the, the book of Mormon have said, but they're happy to just take this one little passage cherry picked out of the second book of Nephi. So I don't know. I don't know what else to say about this, this article. Um, it's wrong. I'm, I didn't read it ahead. I read the uh, the deconstruction of it on Mormon Think, but I didn't read the actual thing ahead, and I didn't think it would make me feel this offended at how much it obfuscates the truth and how much it doesn't really embrace what is reality, and it changes little things here and there, and it and it omits an offensive amount of of facts and of you know parts of their their doctrine and things that the church leaders before that have said. There's just there's no way to reconcile those differences. There's no way to say that that was an intellectually honest article because the people that wrote that article know everything that we've talked about today. And they still were able to write that article and obfuscate the truth in some way or omit some facts in some way to make it sound like it's all okay. And I have no respect for that. I There's Nothing that bothers me more than somebody that is taking a little piece of evidence and then changes it a tiny bit and makes it all sound peachy keen like they weren't in the wrong. The church was in the wrong in this. There's no getting out from under that. I mean, (sighs) so, you know, I just don't know. I, that article was very, very poor. It was very incorrect. And from a, a history buff perspective and somebody that has done a lot of studying on this topic in the past little while, I'm very offended at how much they did not embrace the truth and embrace the history. That if that essay were to go as a as some kind of uh, you know thesis or something about a large historical topic, to say the Mormon Church is a master's student in history, you know, or in early American history, or just history of itself, and they turned in that article as being, you know, a, a historical dissertation of a, you know, a series of events that would just be scoffed at and laughed at in intellectual circles. It's, it's just. There's so much wrong with it, and there's a lot of things that I didn't bring up that I probably could have brought up that I'm not thinking about now. And there's just, it's all just wrong. It's all very twisted and wrong. But, um, you know, before the closing rant, I did say that I have a treat for you guys. And this treat is something that I've been excited to, to splice into this episode for a while because I brought on a special guest, and his name is Ishmael Brown from the Angry Black Rant Atheist. Now, some people might wonder, why would you bring Ishmael Brown onto this? You know, are you just bringing him on to be your black guy punching bag or something? No, the reason why I have Ishmael on is because I want to read some of these quotes to him, and I want to feel his reaction to some of the inherent racism of it. Not only because he is black and he does have a you know a much more personal connection to this, um, but because he's a very skeptical and very intelligent guy, and he's funny and he speaks his mind really well. And I think that's where I want to bring him in on this: is I want his perspective, another skeptical atheist perspective, that on these horrible topics of racism in the church and how. The, the history of the church is so deeply mired in racism and it can't divorce itself from the racist tenets that it held on to. Racist doctrines. Doctrine, there's that word. It's an important word to, to assert that that is what this was, is racist doctrine. So I'm bringing on Ishmael Brown to talk about this and I hope you guys really enjoy it. And I'm afraid if you're not a Patreon supporter, um, that that's pretty much the end of it. 
Um, anybody that is a Patreon supporter, go to patreon.com and listen to this episode on there. You can hear my interview with Ishmael Brown fully intact, and he makes some amazingly good points. I also wanted to thank Ishmael very much for coming onto the show. I really enjoyed the conversation with him. He's just an awesome guy, a really, really funny guy. Um, but not all is lost. Um, if you are just absolutely craving hearing the interview or hearing the discussion that Ishmael and I had, you know, we, we started with these, these racist quotes as jumping off points, but we wrapped it into a bigger discussion about how racism still exists and how, uh, you know, a black atheist perspective is, or, you know, a black atheist experience and coming out as an atheist is so much different than a white atheist. And just the, uh, the differences in experience between, you know, white people and black people, then those are very important things to talk about. And saying that, you know, racism is something that doesn't exist is something that, is uh, that's an argument from ignorance. It's, it's just downright wrong. And I wanted to bring Ishmael on just to talk about those things because they're very, very important to me. Um, as a humanist, I really want to embrace as many true things and as few false things and make the most good for as many people as possible. And, um, embracing the fact that racism is a reality and working to change it and striving to raise awareness and change it is, um, You know, it's something that I I feel like there hasn't been enough of in the secular or any other community. So, um, Ishmael, thank you so much for talking and for for that interview. But like I said, not all is lost. Uh, For this Monday, this episode is coming out on Thursday, May 5th. On uh, Monday, May 9th, Ishmael and I are actually going to do an episode of his show. I'm going to guest host on his show. We're going to talk politics and, you know, kind of an extension of the conversation that we talked about. And we're also going to splice onto that, or he's going to splice onto that, the discussion that we had that, that, you know, only Patreon listeners can get. So if you're not a Patreon listener and you want to hear that discussion, you got to go to angryblackrant.com and listen to his newest episode. I believe it's episode 37 and he will title it Naked Mormonism or Bryce Blanken Eagle or something like that. So it's easy to find. Um, just in a mere you know, four days, be looking out for the next episode of Angry Black Rant and you can hear my discussion with Ishmael Brown about you know, blacks in the priesthood. You can hear the exact version that is spliced in for Patreon listeners only on his show. So please be sure to check that out. Um, we had a really fun discussion and it was, you know, I, I just thoroughly enjoyed talking with him. You know, Ishmael's a really great guy. So, you know, to close all of this up, you know, what can we learn from everything today? I know that this episode has been huge. This has been a really, really long episode, but this is a huge topic, you know, and covering the Book of Mormon, obviously the Book of Mormon is a bigger topic than this, but I took seven and a half hours to do it. And there's so much that I left out, but you know, with, with race and the priesthood, I feel like, you know, with a lot of things, we, we did cover them in a fair amount of detail, but there's still so much that I just barely scratched the surface on. But you know, what, what can we learn from it all today? I mean, I like to finish up episodes by drawing a really big circle around everything that we've discussed, uh, but, you know, we've just covered so much today. But I think the main point worth discussing is the driver of change. You know, what is it that drives change? That's just a huge, huge question. A lot of historians argue the validity of the, the great man theory, asserting that history is often driven by the actions of one great man like Napoleon or Alexander the Great or, you know, Timujin Genghis Khan or something. But the flip side of that argument falls into the category of tides and forces, asserting that it wasn't great men that have made history, but rather history that have made these great men. Now, I, I find a lot of validity to both of these arguments. I mean, I mean, I mean let's face it, you don't have a Hitler without the First World War and the Versailles Treaty. The environment that nurtured the National Socialist German Workers' Party into existence that allowed Hitler to rise to power never would have gained traction without all the pressure that Germany was under from the Versailles Treaty, thus the tides and forces. The environment existed, and a man with a little bit of charisma and some very hardline ideas was able to step into a power vacuum and become the most notorious and villainous conqueror of the 20th century. Now, 
There's a, a bit of give and take, I think, with these two competing theories of historical analysis. You know, the ties and forces created a situation where a great man could step in and rise to power. So I think both of them are equally responsible for being the drivers of change. But does this example, you know, map to the monumental shift in Mormon doctrine, you know, the driver of change in that, that we've been discussing today? Many people, you know, especially Mormons today, claim that one of the greatest prophets was Spencer W. Kimball. I mean, at least you hear that name much more frequently than you hear like Howard W. Hunter or Lorenzo Snow or something. But with the change in history of blacks getting the priesthood, I mean, it can be argued that it was driven by a great man, namely Spencer W. Kimball, the prophet at the time. His name was signed on the revelation. He was the prophet of the church. He, he, you know, he basically spearheaded the revelation that would lift the ban. Spencer W. Kimball, in this case, was arguably the great man that drove this change. But let's consider the flip side of that for a minute and look at the tides and forces model of this point in Mormon history. We've discussed the pressures that the church was under when they brought this revelation out in 1978. We know the BYU sports teams were in jeopardy and that the new Brazil temple wouldn't have any attendance if the ban stayed in place. I mean, the final straw that broke the racists back was a threat to the church's tax-exempt status. Considering all these forces that were in play, the church had to make a change. And in my opinion, I think Spencer W. Kimball was the man that stepped into that power vacuum and is treated today as a great man for the things he did at such a crucial time in American history. Whether he was the actual driver of that change or not, I don't think it really matters. And that's the point of bringing to light all of the history surrounding the priesthood ban. We can't just look at it in a vacuum and think that this revelation was given through the prophet by God, descending from the clouds like Hinckley made it sound. It's important to understand the reality that led to the revelation being given. The big point that this whole episode has been about surrounds one very challenging question. Given everything that we know about racism and politics in the church during the 1970s, does this sound like a church run by an almighty God, or does it sound more like something men would be running? I mean, really, what would we expect it to look like if an almighty God that is no respecter of persons that made us all equal were actually running the show? Now, of course, this this is an unanswerable question, but it's still fun to speculate on. And this is what I'm going to do. Personally, you know, this is just speculation. So let me make that clear. I would assert that God never would have created the need for this revelation to come down in the first place. He would have seen in the future how much trouble a ban on the priesthood would cause the church once legal segregation was criminalized in 1954. So it would make sense that God never would have had the ban in the first place. Why would God create those struggles for his prophet apostles and members to deal with? How could a timeless God not see the writing on the wall, or, you know, how could he not know what 150 years in the future would hold? I think that, and that's that's just what I think, if God were indeed running the church, it would have been all-inclusive from the beginning, come hell or high water, persecution or not. But that's only if the church were led by the almighty God that created us all equal. Instead, We see the church holding on to antiquated ideals until the brink where the very existence of the church is threatened by legal ramifications. And then, and only then, did they come forward with a revelation that fixed the problem and relieved these social and political pressures. In my opinion, that sounds much more like a church led by old white guys that don't feel the negative effects of their church doctrine until it threatens their pocketbook. And only after that final threat was in place did they actually react in 1978. But that says nothing about the pain and frustration that the priesthood ban caused up to that point. It says nothing about the black families that lived and died, knowing that they couldn't get into heaven because of the color of the skin or the curse on their ancestors. 
These old white guys never felt the sorrow and anger of the racism their church incited and embodied. They were never kept out of the boys club just because the color of their skin. So why would these old duffers change? They didn't feel the negative effects of the priesthood ban until it threatened their pocketbook. This shift in church doctrine was very clearly, in my opinion, a political and public relations move handled by fallible men. It's odd, isn't it, how how politics can change church doctrine? I mean, for example, Joseph was somewhat progressive for his time, but now we can understand just how racist he was. I mean, the most remarkable thing about Joseph's racism is that it changed due to political pressures as well. And this is a quote that I talked about earlier, and it's time, it's finally time to read it. In 1844, the year Joseph died in the Carthage gunfight, he was also running for president of the United States. Up to this point, the church had been proselyting to slaves in Missouri, which caused a lot of problems with slave owners in Missouri. But Joseph needed to distance himself from that past in order to not offend slave-owning voters he was pandering to. This is the statement Joseph Smith made that was later canonized as revelation into the scripture um, in the Book of Covenants in chapter uh, or section 134, verse 12, much like the 1978 revelation would be canonized 134 years after this. And this is what the LDS.org Race in the Priesthood article was talking about when Joseph in his later years um, denied uh, slavery. And I think there's a little bit more to that than, than initially meets the eye. And this was a quote for his presidential bid. Quote, We believe it just to preach the gospel to the nations of the earth and warn the righteous to save themselves from the corruption of the world. But we do not believe it right to interfere with bond servants, slaves, neither preach the gospel to nor baptize them contrary to the will and wish of their masters, nor to meddle with or influence them in the least to cause them to be dissatisfied with their situations in this life, thereby jeopardizing the lives of men. Such interference, we believe, to be unlawful and unjust and dangerous to the peace of every government allowing human beings to be held in servitude. End quote. This statement from Joseph Smith was obviously a political move to gain votes. There's simply no way of claiming that it wasn't. The church asserted in the Race and the Priesthood article that this was his divorcing from slavery, like this was Joseph saying that slavery was a bad thing, but no, he never said that at any point in that quote. He said that we believe it's okay to preach the gospel to everybody, but if slave masters don't want us to preach to their slaves, we don't think it's right to interfere with their wishes. We don't think that we should do anything that would cause the slaves to be dissatisfied with their situation in this life, thereby jeopardizing the lives of men. He talks about the church interfering in you know, slave-master relations was something that was unlawful and unjust and dangerous to the peace of every government, allowing human beings to be held in servitude. He never divorced his own thoughts and his own ideas on racism or on on uh, slavery. He just said that we're not going to preach to slaves anymore. And it was a political move to gain votes from racist slave owners. You couldn't become a president in 1844 if you didn't have some sort of caveat or some sort of out for the slave owners to support you because nobody else in southern states would vote for you. So... I mean, what conclusions, if any, can we draw from this? I mean, these aren't my conclusions, so feel free to make your own conclusions. But in my opinion, the church is fallible, led by fallible human beings that create policy and doctrine based on their own fallible beliefs. From the inception of the church with Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery down to the 2013 essay on race and the priesthood and forever moving forward, the church has been and always will be subject to the leadership of antiquated old white guys that are so disconnected from reality that they don't feel the everyday struggles that their members go through every single day. It's only when the leadership's most important concern is threatened, money, that they actually move or change a sincerely held religious belief or doctrine. 
And please don't think that the irony is lost when it came to the recent stance the Mormon church took on families with same-sex parents. I mean, this all spawned from a leaked document that mentioned gay parents not being able to be sealed in the temple. And when it was publicized, the church came out with an official statement claiming that not only can gay parents not be sealed in the temple, but their children can't be considered true members of the church until they are 18 and can decide for themselves. Is there really no lesson to draw from history on this much more modern Mormon topic? Can we not draw some line of equivocation between gays not being allowed to do temple ordinances now and blacks not being able to do them before the 1978 revelation? Are you kidding me? The church is doing the same thing with excising these gay members or their families or, you know, relegating them to be some kind of subcategory of member. They can't be sealed in the temple to each other and their children. They can't hold leadership positions in the church. Gays can't get married in the temple. They can't even be considered full members until they deny their own human sexual nature and try to marry and live with somebody of the opposite sex every day battling their same sex attraction, which goes completely contrary to their nature and, you know, personal sexuality. Now, why didn't the church just ask black people to stop being black? Because they're asserting that the same is possible with gays. The only difference is a person can hide their sexuality from the outside world. And unless you're Michael Jackson, black people can't hide the color of their skin. How much longer must we try to conform to the church before we realize that it should conform to us? How many more families must be torn apart by the church before the people in those families say, I don't need this church anymore? Let me close on a final and depressing note here. The church asserts that it was never racist or anything that was racist in its past is not espoused by the leadership today. But let's just examine that claim. The leadership of the church is supposed to be representative of the members. Out of the quorum of the 12 apostles, no black man has ever served as a member. No black man has ever been part of the presidency of the church, and even today, only two men of the more than 100 general authorities are black. Out of the thousands of men that have served in church leadership roles, only a minuscule percent have ever been black. Sure, you can find a couple examples today of a black bishop, patriarch, or stake president, or something to that effect, but the numbers simply don't lie. Racism is still a very strong part of Mormonism today, and until they bring substantially more black men in to be more representative of their believers, this racism will always be there. And please, don't think it stops there, because black men have only recently become accepted as full members of the church capable of holding leadership positions. The church argued that black men couldn't hold the priesthood or leadership positions because that was doctrine for so long. But they're cutting out 50% of their representation due alone to doctrine. It's about a 50-50 split of men and women that are members of the church, and no woman has ever held a single leadership position above Release Society president before. Why, you may ask? Well, because it's church doctrine that men run the church and women make the babies. This is embraced church doctrine and has been since the beginning. If you want to discuss a maligned group of members in the church, let's get the conversation rolling about women getting the priesthood again. I mean, the the whole Kate Kelly and ordained women thing had a lot of press for a while, but there was never enough pressure for the church to respond in any sort of meaningful way. They excommunicated her, and they think the problem has been dealt with. Women have been oppressed in this church since day one, and it's just taken as doctrine that can never be overridden. How many times did I say woman this whole episode before now? Well, from a quick word search, about six from what I can tell. Those were talking about the black woman, Jane Manning, who was sealed to Joseph and Emma as their slave for the eternity, and the woman, Bathsheba Smith, that stood in for her during that said sealing ordinance, that, you know, that white woman, Bathsheba Smith, that was representative of the black woman, Jane Manning. 
The only other time I mentioned the word woman before two paragraphs ago was the man and woman that Darius Gray ran up to in the car and the woman rolled down her window just to tell them that they were passing through Utah. It's not my fault that women had no place in today's episode. It's just the nature of this male-centric religion. It's a boys club at this point that we've talked about since the beginning of this podcast a year and a half ago. Women have been banned from leadership and priesthood since the beginning. And it's a doctrine of the church that they be treated that way. Well, so was the priesthood ban, but it changed. In my eyes, the church will continue to be xenophobic, racist, and misogynistic until a gay, transgender black woman is the prophet. (laughs) You can scoff at that. And it may sound utterly ridiculous, but that is the only ultimatum that would make me sit back and say, well, maybe this church has changed to be a little bit more progressive and accepting. Until then, the Mormon church and every Mormon carries those negative labels with them, whether wittingly or not. Even the black woman on the cover of this month's issue of the church's monthly magazine, The Enzyme, is a pathetic facade and a misplaced attempt to express how racist and sexist the church isn't. Those little tokens of progressivism are paper thin and aren't matched by the church's other public policies and agendas. We can see right through you. But they can change. And that's one silver lining that with having a church that's run by modern revelation and new revelation trumping old revelation. The church can make a major shift in doctrine and just point to the sky and say, we were told to do it by him, by the dude upstairs, a dude sitting in the clouds. But given everything we've discussed this far, the church is a giant and doesn't have to move until provoked. That provocation needs to come from somewhere. And the trouble is, I don't know where. There, there, there's just no simple solution to this until thousands of women, black, transgender, and gay people walk out of the church. Nothing will happen until membership numbers begin to drop off. The church won't embrace the 21st century until their tax-exempt status is threatened again for being sexist and homophobic. How long does this have to take? The energy is there and people are mad. People see their loved ones being cut off from the church every day and the groundswell is happening. It just needs to be pointed in the right direction. The only question is, will the members of the church settle for one small revelation that just allows gays to be sealed to each other? Or will these disenfranchised people stand up once and for all and march until major reform upends the very structure of the church? The leadership of the Latter-day Saints Church has a decision to make. They can take this change into stride and get ahead of the curve by making these major reforms right now. Or they can continue to hold on till the last thread snaps And the largest exodus of members brings the walls of this city-state crumbling down upon itself. I can't wait for the latter. But until then, we'll just have to wait and see. But that's it for this episode, for the clean-cut episode of Race in the Priesthood. Um, I will be doing a listener mail section and a Patreon appreciation section next episode. Um, And I have to say, I will be taking one week off in order to finish getting my parents moved. Um, That If you're listening in the backlogs, this doesn't matter as much. But if you're keeping up with the show, the episode that should be coming out on Thursday the 12th is not going to come out. The next episode will come out on Thursday, May 19th. Um, I have to do this because we're getting down to crunch time on the move and, um, this is just how the schedule works out. So, um, you know, first, first vacation uh, of the podcast I've taken since the podcast started. So that being said, thank you very much for listening. Thanks to Demon Easter for running the Facebook page. Thank you to Jason Camo for the music in this show, which is used with his permission. You can find more of his stuff at a lost state of mind.com. Thanks to Craig Keeling for the artwork for this show and for the Glassbox podcast, The Sister Show. You can find his stuff at weirdmormonshit.com. 
I'd like to say thank you very much to the Patreon supporters of this show that make it go and allow me to do this full time. And thank you most of all to listeners for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism podcast. <laughs>